we're talking today about youth, about aging. If we're talking about these processes, we need to start from the very beginning. Let's start with the fact that there is a force that rejuvenates a person and ages a person, and both forces are present in a person. The force that ages is called material time. Time has two concepts. There is spiritual time which acts in the spiritual world and within the human soul. This is a spiritual time in the spiritual world inside the soul. Spiritual time constantly rejuvenates a person. So there is such a Sanskrit concept, Ananda Buduki Vardhana, that means ever-increasing happiness. Ananda means happiness. Vardhana means ever-increasing happiness. In spiritual reality, happiness is constantly increasing. Happiness never decreases there. You become happier, happier, and happier, and so on infinitely. Those who live in the spiritual world have ever-increasing happiness, and a person in their heart and soul wants happiness to always increase. They believe in this. If a person has stopped believing that happiness will increase, they decide that I'm already 70 years old, what happiness it could be. As a result, happiness will not increase from this moment, while aging will start to increase. If a person believes in this, if they decide that their happiness will never increase from now on, then they will age. So faith means contact. A person can be in contact with ever-increasing happiness. This is spiritual reality. Or a person can be in contact with the energy that decreases happiness. If we talk about the energy that decreases happiness or the energy of material time, then we should know how it works. Whether we want it or not, it always acts on the material, physical body. The energy of material time will always act just at different speeds. We are also going to talk about this. It means a person will still age. Some say that they know the recipe for eternal youth. So the recipe for eternal youth, sorry for my yawning, birds are singing here, the sun is relaxing me. It's just happiness, the energy of happiness relaxes me. That's why I started yawning, the body says I don't want to be tense, I want to relax. The body has its own desires. So there is no recipe for eternal youth in the material world. To have eternal youth, one needs to reach the spiritual world. There is eternal youth in the spiritual world. Everyone is eternally young there. There are no old people, only young. In the material world, material time acts and affects primarily the material body, the physical body. Whoever is born will surely die. And whoever dies will surely be born again. Why must one be born again? Because besides the physical body, there is also a spiritual body. And the spiritual body does not age. The soul does not age. There is no old age in it. The soul is subject only to the energy of spiritual time. But the soul can direct its own consciousness because the energy of the soul is consciousness to different things. The soul can direct its attention to matter and then it becomes involved in the aging process. Thus the soul, which considers itself to be a material body, experiences old age. It says, Dr. Torsunov, no matter how you look at it, an old man is not a child. No matter how you look at it, an old man can be like a child if he is a holy person. If a person is outwardly old, but he is a saint in the heart, then he is a child in his soul. He feels like a child. He doesn't feel old. Why? Because the soul is eternally young by nature. The soul is me. I am the soul. I am not Dr. Torsunov. I am the soul. It means I am in this body of Dr. Torsunov. And in the next body, I could be Maria Petrovna. Who knows? The soul can take on either a female or male body. It can be in the spiritual world and it can live in a subtle energy body on heavenly planets. There is no physical body there, only subtle energy bodies or spiritual ones. There are three bodies in general. There is a physical body. In the physical body, the soul lives on the middle planets. On the lower and higher planets, the soul lives in a subtle energy body. The subtle energy body is also a material body. It's also matter. But under the influence of time, this matter ages differently. The old age is in the subtle energy body in the human psyche. And it is expressed in the accumulation of difficulties. A small child may have poor health and generally find it hard to live, but they don't perceive it as hardship. They certainly don't agree with it. They may cry, but they don't feel it's too hard. When a person simply wakes up and feels that it's hard to live, it means they are already aged. So as a person ages, from early morning, they begin to feel that it's hard to get up, hard to eat, hard to live in general. When there is a psychologically accumulated feeling that life is hard, it is called aging of the subtle energy body. But it's interesting to know if a person, even at an older age, accepts the challenge of aging of the subtle energy body. They say, yes, life is hard, but I'm performing more and more asceticism practice to live. And when a person neutralizes this hard to live with their asceticism practice, they can remain young in their psyche, but at the same time they become wiser. So a person cannot feel good at an older age and not be wise. As you age, you'll have to become a sage if you want to feel happy. 
to be young in your psyche. A sage is one who knows how to overcome one's fate. It means fasting, motionless body position, prolonged movement. These are three types of human rejuvenation. Prolonged, continuous movement, stationary position of the body, and fasting. These are three kinds of human rejuvenation. These are the three main types of asceticism practice. A person should perform them in life to live happily and youthfully. There is a fourth type of asceticism practice, which is called prayer, or in other words, attunement to God, remembrance of God, setting ourselves up for God. What is prayer? Prayer is a way to set ourselves up for God, to remind ourselves of God. When a person sets themselves up for God, they connect with spiritual time. Let's say someone comes to you and says, I'm so spiritual, I pray so much, but why do I feel so bad? If a person approaches you and says this, it means they are hypocrites. So if a person is spiritual, they think about God, then they switch to spiritual time. What does spiritual time do to a person? It makes them joyful and happy. It overcomes fate. What is fate? Difficulties. Difficulties come to the physical body and the subtle energy body. It's not that the amount of difficulties changes. Let's say, with age, more and more difficulties come out from within per unit of time. This is how material time affects the psyche. But if a person prays, then all these difficulties that have come out from within are removed, and they feel good anyway. They are mentally happy, we say happy in soul. This is actually called mental happiness. Thus, only love for God can make a person be happy in the soul. It means love for God is a purely spiritual feeling. Everything else is mental feelings. They are happy and good if a person has overcome all the difficulties that are meant for today with the help of asceticism practices. Thus, mental youth is maintained by the fact that a person removes all difficulties from the psyche every day of their life. As for bodily youth, there are two types of time influence just as in the psyche. The first type of time influence is daily, ordinary difficulties. The second type of time influence is called a bad period, when difficulties fall so heavily on the psyche. You pray all day and do everything right, but still the burden weighs on you because a bad period is in progress. This period is trying to extinguish you, trying to break you. In other words, there is a cyclical and there is a stable influence of time on the psyche. Every day it becomes more and more difficult for a person to live. The burden becomes heavier, as in the song. Everything that nature has assigned to us should be gratefully accepted. It means we shouldn't be afraid but move forward. So one kind of mental aging is where the burden gets heavier every day. It's a steady, gradual buildup of difficulties in the psyche. Another type of mental aging is called a cycle, cyclical. Today it seems like the burden is weighing on me, but not like yesterday. So yesterday was really hard and today is a bit easier, still hard, but easier old age or with age. When it's hard and doesn't get easier, this is called another type of time influence, cyclical time influence. So there is stable aging and there is cyclical aging of the psyche. Suddenly it came down. A person was living without worry. And then bang, and they say, it's really hard for me psychically. This lasts for a month or two or three. Usually in such situations, a person finds someone to blame and wants to shift the blame onto someone. Well, why is it so hard for me all the time? Probably because of my wife. Who else could be to blame for this? It's hard for me to live with her. I'll leave her now, and it will get easier. But a person puts themselves into such an illusion. They think it's hard for them because of a loved one. Everyone always finds someone to blame when a difficult psychological period comes. Everyone starts looking for scapegoats, and you can even make a claim against a column. Why are you standing here? The column didn't do anything, it's just standing there. But you can make a claim against it. Why did you stand here? That's how a loved one is also blamed for everything, if you feel bad. Therefore, people usually either destroy their work or leave their wife or husband when they're going through a bad psychological cycle. It means they find someone to blame and thus ruin their own life. But good righteous people overcome mental difficulties through prayer and asceticism practice, and they don't destroy anything. They simply become more resilient and wiser. Another type of influence of material time is its effect on the physical body. The physical body gradually ages, and in general, no one is against it. If a person peacefully and quietly passes away at 90 years old, everyone is only happy. No one is against it. Everyone is happy. Thank God he's no longer suffering. 90 years is a good time to peacefully pass away. But when a person dies at 50 or 60, no one is happy. Or at 40 or 30 or 20, no one is happy. Because it happened unexpectedly. This is called the cyclical influence of time. Time is pressing upon a person. The cycle is so powerful and strong. He couldn't take it and passed away. Immediately a question arises. Is it always possible to cope with the cyclical influence of time on the body? The answer is, it's possible to cope with it for 99% if a person lives correctly. That's why a healthy lifestyle is necessary. 
Why is it necessary to run for long periods? Why is it necessary to be in a stationary position of the body? Why is fasting necessary? For that moment when the cyclical influence of time is pressing upon you, your body and psyche can withstand it, and that you can move on with your life. Because gradual aging doesn't worry anyone. The body ages slowly and that's it. This doesn't worry anyone. What worries people is when things suddenly get worse. For some reason, things suddenly get worse. That's what worries people. And this is overcome by asceticism practice, prolonged continuous movement, stationary position of the body, and water fasting. There are, of course, other nuances that are very difficult to understand. This is called favorable or unfavorable. It's a different topic, very complicated. On the edge, favorable or unfavorable. For example, I'm now wearing a bandage. There's a capsule inside. Soon it will look very nice, but I've just made it with tape for now. This capsule contains herbs. I've selected them in such a way that while I'm sitting, my body is healing all the infections inside that were uninvited there. Moreover, some are chronic. As it turned out, when I put this herbal mixture on, I realized that I have a chronic infection in my ear canals, in one of the sinuses here. There's an infection in the groin area. When I applied this herbal mixture, I saw how the treatment began there. There was some activity going on. Something was cured. A person might not notice this, so it's favorable. I've mixed nine types of herbs in a certain way, applied them, and they simply emit a vibration. They don't even touch the body, and my body is set up to destroy all infections. Did you notice what's happening? This is hidden advertising. You might soon have these bracelets too, right? And that's it. It costs pennies. For about a month of such treatment, it's around $5. That's how we calculate it now. You can wear this for a whole month, or maybe longer. If you wear it for six hours a day, then you can wear it for four months. This is physiologically normal wear. And if you're sick or you have coronavirus, you should wear them 24 hours for a month. But it's unlikely that anyone is going to wear one for 24 hours a day for a month. Usually to cure any cold, you have to wear it 24 hours a day for a week. There are favorable and unfavorable things. There are unfavorable colors that attract evil forces. There are favorable colors that attract good forces. Favorable colors are similar to precious stones. Find all the precious stones. They are sapphire, blue sapphire, yellow sapphire, emerald, diamond, moonstone, chrysolite, cat's eye, coral, all these stones indicate favorable colors. Favorable colors increase life expectancy or help a person be happy and cheerful, while unfavorable colors reduce this possibility. Fresh air increases longevity, but when there's no fresh air in a room, the air is stale and musty, and longevity is decreased. There's a deception here. For example, an air conditioner doesn't provide fresh air. It just cools it. Fresh air only comes from nature, from the window. So if you don't open the windows, it's not good. Let's say you live in a city and your windows face a highway. You think, I won't open them because smoke comes from there. This is incorrect thinking. You can install some filters, for example, but fresh air still needs to come into the apartment. If it doesn't come in and you have just air conditioning, then you will age faster because prana, the energy of nature, gives life to a person. The sun gives life to a person. Fresh air, earth, water, space as a whole. Space, spaciousness gives a person the energy of life. And when these energies are lacking, it increases death. Let's say the sun. You might say, but we don't have sun in St. Petersburg. People tell me, there is sun in St. Petersburg. It's just hidden behind clouds. The sun means cheerfulness. There are three solar energies. The first solar energy is coarse tejas. This is what's abundant in the south. It means the sun is shining hard. It can burn. It can lead to skin cancer. For example, in African countries, a very common disease is skin cancer. The sun burns the skin and gradually leads to cancer. There's unlikely to be much skin cancer in St. Petersburg because the sun doesn't burn. It's very soft. Subtle tejas is energy that improves digestion. When the sun is high, a person's food digests well. This is the time to have lunch. When the sun is at its zenith, you should have lunch because digestion will be good. Even if you're in a cave underground, you'll still feel it. You'll still feel the fire of digestion even somewhere in Arkhangelsk in the north. The digestive fire increased at 12 noon. In other words, subtle tejas doesn't depend on the latitude where you live. On the equator or near the north or south pole, you will want to eat at 12 noon because there is a subtle tejas. There is another tejas, another solar energy. This is solar energy that gives a person good mood, cheerfulness and optimism. And this type of solar energy is transmitted through people and living beings. So even in St. Petersburg, if a person smiles, they attract to themselves. They're like a magnet, like an antenna. 
They attract the energy of the sun to themselves. A sunny person, a sunny person attracts the energy of the sun and therefore the energy of life, because all these elements also give life to a person. They increase longevity, and a person can attract these elements to themselves either by going out into nature naturally or through an internal process. Let's say if you're sitting in prison, they don't let you out into nature, so you can simply think about the sun, think about the earth. As this song goes, the earth is visible in the porthole, and we dream not of the roar of the cosmodrome, not of this icy blue space, but we dream of grass, grass near home, green, green grass. Why do cosmonauts dream of grass near home? Because they can't receive the energy of Earth's nature in space just by looking out the porthole. They can receive this energy through memory. If they remember the Earth and the grass, it means they receive the energy of nature. You can also receive the energy of nature through memory because the mind is capable of connecting with any object just by thinking about it. That's how the nature of the mind works. If you remember your loved one, you connect with them in real time. Therefore, if a person has passed away, it doesn't mean you're separated. You can remember them and you will connect with them in real time. Connect with this person. But people don't believe in this. That's why they don't connect. They say, he died. Died means he's gone. He's no longer here. We say, he's no longer here. But where is he? Where is Vasily Petrovich? He's no longer here. Where is Vasily Petrovich? He's gone, but he's still present. You just don't know about it. Think of a small child whose mother hides, and he thinks she is gone. The child cries, thinking mom is lost, even though she is actually nearby, just not visible. This is much like when a person passes away. We, like children, often struggle to understand that someone who has passed away still exists, albeit unseen. Keeping their memory alive helps to ease our grief. People don't leave or die, they simply continue to exist, and they transition to another existence. Although we believe in eternal life, our perception of the afterlife is quite rudimentary. We envision the afterlife as living among clouds where angels are sitting on the clouds feeling bored and observing us from above. We picture the next life as floating on clouds. People often think, it's too early for me to die. I still have things to do. What would I do just sitting on a cloud? Even in the afterlife, there are things to do and purpose. The afterlife is not about idly sitting on a cloud. Life continues there with various pursuits and activities, both in heaven and in hell, with their respective activities. So fundamentally, life continues, although not like here. A person remains active and engaged, with all their processes continuing, just in a different place, not where they are now. That's why people often perceive this incorrectly. They start to grieve excessively and long for a person. It's natural to feel sadness and separation, but overwhelming longing is incorrect and harmful. Sometimes when one person dies, another follows soon after. Why? This often happens because they are overwhelmed by longing. While separation is normal, one longs for a close-lived contact. Separation is normal, but longing is not. Longing suggests that you think the person is gone, which is destructive and leads to death. When a person has passed away, you shouldn't long for them. Even after someone passes away, you shouldn't think that they are gone and the contact with them is lost. There remains a form of connection, just not in the way you may wish. Everything has changed, but it hasn't disappeared. There's some confusion here. Firstly, the concept of white clouds or heaven. White clouds or heaven do not involve a creator. They are part of the material realm, though in a more subtle form. In this realm, beings experience happiness and heavenly pleasure. Everything is perfect, akin to being at a resort. You don't need to do anything. It's like you arriving at a resort, such as Odessa, and enjoying yourself there as described in the song, I will not speak to you for all Odessa. It's a place of relaxation and enjoyment, like a resort. Heavenly planets are resort planets. You arrive there after life if you lived well and did what was right, but only for yourself and not for God. If you have lived honestly and correctly, you end up in heaven. But if you lived for God and dedicated your entire life to Him, then you don't go to heaven, you go to the spiritual world. In the spiritual realm, you end up in the Creator's embrace. Here the soul doesn't calm down, rather it becomes even more vibrant and active. The soul awaits the Creator, experiences separation, and then reunites with God in a continuous dynamic. Everyone is alive and active, engaged in service and love. The spiritual world is characterized by constant fervor and activity. It's not a place of calm like heaven. Being there is all about ongoing engagement and service. Heaven is a place where the soul can rest. 
As many imagine, it is a place with white clouds. In the Vedas, heaven is described as rivers of milk and shores of jelly, representing a place of perfect enjoyment and comfort. The book Dano on the Moon captures this well, with imagery of large trees, honey flowing in streams, and an environment free from decay or hunger. There are no bacteria, and nothing gets spoiled. Everything is edible and grows abundantly, so no one experiences hunger. There's no need to work. There is no heat, no cold, and no hunger. Everyone enjoys themselves in heaven. They are all laid back and beautiful. Sometimes people sense heaven, but they think it's just a fantasy, though it truly is like that. Heaven is the result of a person's life. If they lived correctly according to God's laws, but haven't yet fallen in love with God, or haven't established a relationship with Him, then they go to heaven. In heaven, there are two types. First is the resort-like heaven akin to Sochi. Resort heaven is like a luxurious retreat where no work is needed. If you're at a resort and start working, others might say, why are you working at a resort? Relax, enjoy your rest, then return to your work. There are also other types of heaven where a person comes once they leave this body. What do they do there? They engage in spiritual practices. This is the lunar type. There is also a solar type. The solar path doesn't equate to a resort. It involves significant ascetic practices, but in a pure heavenly atmosphere. Who goes to heaven following the solar path? Those people who work on themselves and don't relax in happiness, yet haven't established a relationship with God, they gradually ascend towards God. Those who just lived correctly and did nothing bad to anyone go to resorts. Then they go back to earth again. They enjoy heaven, like a vacation in Sochi, and then they come back home to earth for ordinary life. Many misunderstand heaven as a mere fairy tale, but it's not a fairy tale. Cartoons depicting butterflies and idyllic landscapes where everything is big and pretty and everyone is happy, this is heaven. They're showing pure heaven, as described in the Vedas. If someone believes that miracles and love are absent in our world, it's a deeply sad and misguided perspective. I took action and tried to get through to the doctors. I told them about a method that successfully cured 50 people who previously tested positive for coronavirus. They were skeptical, dismissing it as mere self-suggestion. However, self-suggestion does not cure a virus. It has a profound internal effect on a person. Some people wore nothing else but bandages without taking antibiotics and still saw their temperatures drop in a day or two, just like that. This is nothing less than a miracle since nothing physically touches the body. Although this approach might seem miraculous to us, it is genuinely real and effective. If someone believes that miracles and love are absent from our world, it reflects a disheartening and narrow-minded view. It's ironic because it disregards the limitless nature of knowledge and the opportunity to learn more. For example, electricity no longer amazes us. We simply accept that light comes from a light bulb without a second thought. What once seemed miraculous has become something we're used to. However, there are still many things that remain difficult for us to understand how they work. We must not only accept and believe in these things, but also study them. This is a sign of common sense. Scientists embody this curiosity. They explore and observe how things function, without dismissing them, simply because they don't understand them yet. This is a trait of a true scientist. However, there are agnostic scientists who say, no, no, it's not possible, it's fiction. Some people just refuse to accept it. We should believe and seek to understand things that aren't clear. For instance, how is it that I pray and then find a job? There's no direct connection. It seems impossible. Or think about how running boosts willpower. I just ran. And the next moment, voila. I can push myself to pass exams, learn a new language, or approach the person I love and say, I love you, let's date. That means summoning the courage to take bold actions in life. Well, who knows, she might say, get lost. And you might feel hurt afterwards, you'll cry and worry, but you go forward, you're not afraid, because you have a strong willpower impulse, and this is simply the result of running. This, too, is a miracle. People shouldn't fear these miracles, but should instead seek to understand the meaning of life, which includes struggle and acceptance. When, for example, a person faces great difficulties, they begin to understand more deeply how this world is arranged. This often happens when faced with the prospect of death. In the face of death, some of the universe's secrets are revealed. How to maintain a sense of youth even when everything around you is falling apart and things seem bleak. And coronavirus is nothing compared to war. During a war, hope can seem non-existent. With coronavirus, however, there is the expectation that it will eventually end and life will return to what it was. War, however, brings lasting devastation, hunger, and other severe consequences. Rebuilding shattered relationships between nations is a slow process, often fraught with unresolved grievances. All of this is slowly restored. 
Forgiveness is extremely challenging and the process is painstaking. This is the harsh reality of war. During wartime, people become aware of the forces that shape fate and how they are overcome. There are such forces that one can rely on. Let's say you have a difficult situation in life. You simply think of a good friend or a loyal person in your life and suddenly you find the strength to overcome your challenges. It's as if their support reaches you just when you need it most. If you concentrate on failure and negativity, you'll likely attract more of the same. This highlights the impact of time and the aging process. There are also God's forces and they are found in good friends. They are found in knowledge in the scriptures, the forces of God. What is the power of God that works through the scriptures? For instance, the scriptures clearly state that one must not abandon a loved one or pursue divorce. This is a clear and unambiguous directive with no exceptions. By following this divine guidance, one can steer clear of significant troubles. Adhering to these teachings helps navigate life's challenges without falling into major pitfalls. There's an initial catch. Deviating from these principles can lead to unforeseen consequences. A divorce, for instance, might bring severe repercussions as the retribution of fate could become evident. Conversely, if you stay committed to the marriage as advised, things might work out in unexpected ways. You may not initiate a divorce, but you are not destined by fate to live with this person, and you will not live with your spouse. God will make it so. Bye. But you didn't get divorced. You shouldn't dwell on it. By trying to save the family at any cost, you bring improvement to your personal life, leading to positive growth. This principle known as the law of God is explicitly stated in the scriptures. It leaves no room for exceptions. You should focus solely on preserving the family. It's as essential as breathing. There are no deviations. Of course, there can be breath holds, just as a separation from a loved one can strengthen the eventual reunion. Holding your breath can make each subsequent breath feel more intense and refreshing, while holding your breath temporarily enhances the sensation of breathing. But there's no law against breathing itself. Imagine someone humorously insisting, don't breathe, don't breathe, don't breathe, you're next. It highlights the absurdity of such a restriction. It's funny, almost like a joke. The point is there is no divine or natural law that prohibits breathing, just as there is no law that says get divorced or don't breathe. Such ideas are unfounded. Similarly, preserving a child in the womb is guided by principles found in scripture, but there are no absolute rules that dictate preservation in every situation. In other words, by following the rules outlined in the scriptures, you can avoid major difficulties in life. It's like being a fish in water, meaning you always find the right path in life and the correct solution to your challenges. Good friends are one way through which God acts. God also works through the scriptures and through nature. Whenever you're feeling unwell or facing difficulties, always turn to nature whenever you can. God acts through movement and practices of asceticism. This can be continuous physical activity, maintaining a stationary body position, or water fasting. When you commit to these practices, God works through them, and they contribute to your health. God acts through nature, providing health and through good people, offering the strength to overcome difficulties. God acts through the scriptures, giving the opportunity to avoid great misfortune. God acts through the places where people who serve him gather, such as temples and holy sites. What does it mean that God acts? We need to understand this very clearly. It means rejuvenation. In other words, there is the energy of aging, which is material time. When we say that God acts, it means that spiritual time is at work. Where God is present, there is spiritual time, which represents youth. This is happiness, victory, and overcoming difficulties. It's faith that protects from harm and saves from death. The faithfulness of a wife saves from death. These are all the energies of God, because God also acts through the faithfulness of a wife. If we talk about death, on one hand, death is the energy of time. It leads to the death of the body. On the other hand, death can be seen as a personality trait. It arrives a person when the purpose of life within the body has been fulfilled. If the essence of life persists, you are stronger than death. If you are determined to move forward, it's likely that death will not come to you. Yet sometimes death arrives even when you're ready to continue. In such cases, a far greater reward awaits. Imagine a soldier at war. Death may strike. A bullet hits him despite his fierce resolve to survive. He may find himself ushered straight to heaven, receiving immense rewards and a profound sense of happiness. In this way, death appears to come, but it is a liberation, a release from suffering guiding him to heaven. Thus, when one actively seeks life, they are granted it. When one neglects this pursuit, death becomes their fate. We must remember these truths eternally. The scriptures guide us. To ignore them is to invite the snares of fate, drawing us closer to death. 
There are good people in our lives. In times of hardship, if we forget our friends, we risk falling into despair. If you don't go to them, but go to who knows who to solve a problem, then you fall into the trap of fate. Recently, a friend faced a serious heart condition, teetering on the brink of a heart attack. She declared to her friends, I'm passing away, there's no need for doctors. Despite her resolve, her friends reached out to me, knowing she trusted my advice. And I wrote to this woman that you must go to the hospital now because you might have a heart attack. She was hesitant. Hospitals and doctors were not her preference, even though she herself was a doctor. But she complied, and she listened to me and went to the hospital. And the next day, when they relieved her of this attack, she wrote to me, Thank you for saving my life. Although before that, she was set to die. But she needed to be set to listen to good friends. You need to be set up for good people because God acts through them. He tells you, go to the hospital. It's too early for you to die. Although death has come and it says, look, you're about to die now. And the person thinks, that's it, I'm dying. It's over. In this case, they always seem to trust death. But you need to trust good friends. Good friends say, don't die, go to the hospital. We must choose the path of good companionship and heed the wisdom of scriptures. Death comes. It calms the person down, saying it's not scary. You're dying. Everything is fine. You're hanging over a cliff. Let go of your hands. It's okay. You'll fall. It's not scary. But good friends say, give me your hand. It's too early to fall. And you give your hand and climb out of there, although you seem to have already died. So you need to go to good friends. You need to listen to the scriptures. You need to perform asceticism practice. Spend time in fresh air, wear uplifting attire, and consume blessed foods. Avoid detrimental choices. Meat, fish, and stimulants can drain your spirit and vitality. Such foods may not only age the body, but also dull the psyche, diminishing joy and resilience. Of course, you can eat meat and be cheerful, but it's harder. When a person doesn't eat it, it's easier for them to be cheerful. Therefore, living without eating meat is favorable, with meat not favorable. So there are favorable things and there are unfavorable ones. So choose either asceticism practice in life or laziness and death. Aging means that you don't want to move, and the stationary position of the body is also life. If a person doesn't move, they also prolong their life, and moving for a long time also benefits, and not eating prolongs life. Water fasting is also needed to prolong one's life. On one hand, eating prolongs life, and not eating prolongs life, so why is fasting needed? To cleanse the body. When a person fasts, they cleanse both the subtle energy body and physical body from the energy of time. These are cleansing procedures. They are necessary. When a person moves for a long time, they also cleanse themselves. And when they don't move, they also cleanse themselves. All these things contribute to rejuvenation on the physical body and on the subtle plane. There are two forms of rejuvenation. One flows from the subtle energy body to the physical and the other vice versa. This type of rejuvenation through the physical body to the subtle energy body can be done with running, stationary position of the body, and water fasting. You influence the physical body, but the psyche is also cleansed. So running gives a person willpower, optimism. A stationary position of the body gives a person patience. The ability to accept fate and cleansing, water fasting, gives a person purity, clarity of thinking, clarity of perception of the world. So these three types of asceticism practice give three types of mental strength necessary to live. There are also cases when subtle mental things improve physical things. Mental things improve physical ones. For example, ethics. Ethics is a mental thing. As Leo Tolstoy said, vegetarianism transcends mere diet. It embodies a way of thinking rooted in compassion. By embracing nonviolence, we cultivate health as our body thrives when freed from the cycle of violence. You don't want to kill anyone unnecessarily at all. According to the Vedas, if a mosquito lands on you, you can kill it. But if it's just flying around you, don't chase it. Meaning, if the mosquito doesn't bother you, you don't bother it either, if it attacks you. Or let's say, in the garden, insects start eating your vegetables that you grow for consumption, then fight these insects. But if they don't bother you or your vegetables, then don't fight with them. So nonviolence doesn't mean that you never kill anyone ever. War happens too. People kill other people. You fight because they attack you. But this doesn't mean that you always have to kill these people. If they don't attack, then you don't kill. There are certain rules. It's called ahimsa, nonviolence. This rule gives the psyche a certain type of strength that rejuvenates a person physically as well. For example, if a person doesn't follow these principles, they develop atherosclerosis, a tendency to malignant tumors, decreased immunity. All this occurs as a result of violence, himsa. 
You commit violence. Violence is committed against you. You eat meat. The tendency to malignant tumors will increase in the body. Violence in your body will increase. What is a malignant tumor? It's violence against you. What is a viral infection? It's violence against you. You commit violence. Violence is committed against you. If you don't commit violence, violence is not committed against you. Your body becomes healthier because there are fewer processes of violence. So in this way, there is a mental way to influence. You rejuvenate mentally, and the body also rejuvenates from that. Let's say you keep your body clean. Keeping clean doesn't just mean tidying up the room or wearing clean clothes. Cleanliness also means ablution. If you take a shower at least twice a day, this is also necessary for the purity of the psyche, not just the physical body. Water washes away not only physical dirt from the body, but also mental dirt. It's like a transformation. When you stand under water, something profound occurs. You feel reborn, perceiving the world with fresh eyes. So when my assistant Maxim and I arrive in the city for a lecture, we head straight to the bathhouse with our suitcases. In the bathhouse, standing in cold water or lying beneath the steam. During this time, the hot water, the cold water, tunes your psyche to the present moment, to the essence of the city. This process facilitates a renewal. You feel as though you belong to this place, as if you haven't traveled at all. That's why I arrive at lectures feeling refreshed, as if I've always been here. As if I haven't traveled anywhere, as if I've been here all the time. That's how people feel. Why? Because I come after the bathhouse. This is the impact of the bathhouse. An upgrade happens. Contact with water aligns you with the positive reality you are meant to embrace. When you enter the water, you connect with this uplifting reality. That's why regular showers are important, but immersing yourself in standing water is even better. Aim for twice a day for maximum benefit. At home, we often fill a bathtub with water. Instead of simply showering, we immerse ourselves. Standing water is more beneficial than moving water because it is more relaxing and more calming. Moving water still tenses you up a little bit. Standing water relaxes a lot. This knowledge helps through the subtle energy body. It's the standing water that improves health through the subtle energy body. You influence the psyche, and physical health improves. That's how it happens. Similarly, soothing sounds like birds chirping outside your window can improve hormonal functions through the psyche. The sound of chirping embodies the energy of love. When a woman hears these sounds, her hormonal balance improves, and she radiates love, smiling and engaging with those around her. This means a healthy woman. A woman who shares joy and love with everyone is a healthy woman. Love is her essence. It signifies vitality and well-being. If she loves everybody, she has good health. For this to happen, a special energy nourishment is needed, and it comes through the sounds of nature, cock-a-doodle-doo, chirp-chirp. These sounds of nature, they improve mood. And through the subtle energy body, they improve health as well. You need sounds of nature or some kind of sounds. And in general, a person should understand the meaning of life in order to live correctly. One must understand the deeper meaning of life to live it fully. Life isn't just about building houses, planting trees, or raising children. These are important, but they aren't the main goals. The primary goal is to comprehend God, our soul, and the divine essence. We are eternal beings, journeying along a road without end. This road has no beginning and no end. It's very important to understand this every second of movement. If you understand that you're walking a road without beginning and end, then you'll have a different life because you'll fill your life with what's most important. And if you don't understand this, then you won't fill your life with what's most important. You'll fill it with small matters, all kinds of fuss and so on. You see, who connected our life with a road without end? God connected our life with a road without end. We are eternal souls, but we need to understand God is love. God isn't a vengeful figure on a cloud punishing those who stray. He's not an evil man who wants us to obey him or we will be punished. God is love, pure and unwavering, only love. And who connected our life with a road without end? God, only love. The embodied Lord is love. Therefore, love is the main thing in a person's life. Love for God or the highest love, pure, bright love, which is a reflection of love for God, is the main thing in human life. This is what a person lives for. If they have achieved love for all living things, for people, for God, then they have not lived in vain. This function will remain in them in the next life, and it will ultimately lead to God. We must realize that no one is waiting for us but God. We live in this world for a purpose. Yet especially with age, we start to recognize that those we hold dear may not always be with us. I've lost a lot of friends I'll never meet again in this life, some to differing beliefs, others to the passage of time. Eventually, we find ourselves alone. Reflecting on my grandfather's life, I see that it has become a memory. 
past. He has a different existence now. Everything that he had is gone. Even there were different things. Just as it is for all of us, it is like you are alone. Though surrounded by loved ones, partners, family, one must acknowledge that they too will leave, likely forever. Meaning all the people who are near us, they will all leave us someday, and we will part with them, most likely forever, or maybe not. Interestingly, I find that some souls we felt connected to in past lives may not be as close in this one, yet we feel an undeniable bond, even if fate keeps us apart. We may recognize each other and feel some sort of closeness, but cannot recreate past relationships due to the nature of our current lives. For example, in a past life, they may have shared a bond as husband and wife, or as parent and child. When they meet again in this life, there's an instant recognition, a spark of familiarity, yet they cannot rekindle those past ties. They want such relationships with each other because they remember them, but they can't do it because that's how fate works. Fate separates us. We are alone in this world, and this also needs to be understood, because this world is created only to understand that the closest and dearest to you is God. When you believe in this and understand it, you cease to be lonely. Why do monks retreat to the desert without feeling lonely? It's because they are deeply aware of God's presence. They understand that he is their closest companion, engaging with him in meaningful ways, nurturing a profound relationship that transcends solitude. This is not a waste of time. Rather, it is a significant investment in their spiritual growth. When individuals grasp this truth, they often find themselves willingly renouncing worldly attachments. But there's a very important point that if people around you live for God, then you don't need to renounce the world. You just need to take care of them. This will also be a service to God. For example, you can take care of those who live for God or create an environment in which people will live for God or impart knowledge in such a way that people come to God. In any case, this is called service to God, and then you don't need to abstain from the world. Only when you are really determined to serve God in your life, then your memory connects you with time that rejuvenates. Therefore, staying young without faith in God is impossible, because time will still knock you down, and it will do it precisely at the level of the psyche. Those people who don't believe in God, they ultimately become gloomy, they become sullen. But if a person believes in God, they are optimistic throughout their life, they always have joy in their eyes. And this means that they are connected to spiritual time. Aging means breaking a relationship with God. Aging, in the literal sense of the word, is compared to a soul, a spark, flying away from the sun and fading. When we focus on our worries, we fade in the same way. Leave your worries, your ups and downs, and understand that this life is not a child's game. Go back to the sun, take the path of goodness. Follow the sun, do good deeds. If your friend is in trouble, don't rely on a miracle. Hurry to them. Always go the way of goodness. The path of goodness means not to worry about your own affairs yourself, but to act for other people's welfare. Detach from yourself. Do something good for people. Serve God. Help people. Take care of nature. Detach from yourself. This is called the path of goodness. This is the way back to the sun. A spark flies against fate. Fate says, fly away from the sun. All sparks fly away from the sun. But you, on the contrary, fly towards the sun. You fly backwards against fate. You move in the opposite direction. Even if this path is unknown, still go the way of goodness. Everyone says there's no time to go to the temple, no time to do all this. It's all nonsense. But you should fly backwards, and then you will grow younger, and so on. So this is the path of the soul. Service to God begins with good deeds. At first, a person doesn't understand what it means to serve God. What does he need? He has everything. How can we serve? He has this whole world. He is always kind, happy. He has no karma, no fate. Nothing bothers him. Why serve him? Everything is fine with him anyway. What can I do for him? God needs your love. Therefore, do something for him with love. Do a good deed and say, I'm doing this for God. There's even a phrase, for God's sake. What does hello mean? In Russian, for example, it means be healthy. Or, for example, in Chinese, hello means, have you eaten today? Hello means eat, not be healthy, but be full. It was more relevant there when this word arose, be healthy, be full. Sometimes these phrases lose their meaning. Goodbye literally in Russian means until seeing, it means hello again. So goodbye doesn't mean bye, it means until we meet. For example, instead of goodbye, we say in Russian with God. So in with God means understand what you live for, that you actually live for God, you should remember him. So all these words remind us of how to live correctly. But we are constantly going towards death, towards our worries, towards our affairs. 
We don't understand that the purpose of human life is service to God, do good deeds, wishing happiness to everyone, forgiving, loving, enduring, caring, including asceticism practice for the body. This is also a service to God because the body is the temple of God. Some say, why do we need to run? Running is not service to God. Not necessarily true. While running, a person rejuvenates their body. Meanwhile, you can listen to a lecture. You know, it's especially noticeable with age. If you just listen to a lecture, somehow the concentration is lost. But if you run and listen to a lecture, then information will be absorbed well because the brain becomes stiff with age. And when you run or you walk, for example, everything is activated, everything starts moving. If you can't run, then walk and listen to the lecture. As some elderly people say, Dr. Torsenoff, I walk all day, but still I have no health. It's not about walking all day, but you need to move without stopping. If you walked and stopped, walked, stopped, this doesn't heal. Walking is when you go without stopping. For instance, a doctor can come to a patient and ask, did you go today? It means going to the toilet. I'm not talking about it now. From our point of view, one should walk continuously, continuously. This place, as my mentor said, this world is not a place for gentlemen. We all come here with tears in our eyes and leave with tears in our eyes. Everything here is connected with tears. This is a place for asceticism practice, for working on oneself. This is a place where we get challenged. In this place, everything is arranged in such an interesting way. For example, do you know how everything is arranged here? At the moment when you overcome all the difficulties in your heart, at that moment, time will definitely give you new difficulties from your heart. Time acts in such a way this can be compared to a train. There are intervals between the carriages. Here's a train, there are carriages. The train goes. You've passed one carriage, then there's a small interval. This is called happiness. You can breathe easily, smile. This is time for happiness. Then there will be the next carriage. Why? Because life in a human body is designed for purifying consciousness. There is life in paradise where carriages are not needed. Time flows differently there. There is life in hell where there are only carriages. There are no intervals between them. How does hell differ from earthly life? There are no intervals between the carriages there. It's one continuous carriage. That means there's no respite there. There's constant suffering. And here there are breaks between carriages. That's all. This is the difference. That's it. On one hand, it seems like a bad thought. On the other hand, it's good. If you start feeling really good, great, it means that the next carriage will come soon. It doesn't mean anything else. In this material world, we all live to get rid of our bad karma. And the more train carriages pass through the heart in one life, the better a person has lived. To live better means to clear the heart of many, many carriages. It may take five lives, ten lives, and life seems hard, but a person clears their heart of all the carriages. When there are no more train carriages left, one either goes to heaven or to the spiritual world. One will no longer suffer because suffering is meant for this life. The more elevated people are, the more trials they have in life. The train carriages connect together and come in a big pile to make it all happen faster because a person can endure it. If a person can endure trials equal to five train carriages at once, it means five train carriages will leave the heart. If one can handle ten train carriages, ten carriages will leave the heart. Therefore, each person is given their own trials. If a person is stronger, there are more trials in life. If a person is weaker, they have fewer trials. If a person is very weak, even one train carriage can break them. Why? One is very weak due to an incorrect lifestyle. For this reason, a single train carriage can break a person. If one manages to handle a dozen train carriages at once, it means they had a correct lifestyle. A person's life is meant for struggle. The first and last minutes of life indicate this. The purpose of human life is not relaxation, nor a country house, nor a good apartment in the city center, but struggle is the purpose of human life. Even if you strive for calmness, you won't succeed. Aging means that a person has an incorrect attitude towards life. If a person decides to relax, they will age. Aging means that a person has lost their vitality, lost the desire to continue cleansing their consciousness, continue to overcome one's fate, continue to believe. In this world, one can triumph over any obstacle. It never happens that evil defeats the one who does good. Evil will never be able to completely conquer this world. It's impossible. Some say that we will always live with coronavirus now. With such an attitude, these people won't live long at all, neither with coronavirus nor without it. Life on earth has its own laws, which unfortunately such people don't understand. There are difficult periods compared to night. During this difficult period, a person must understand what to do. They must hear the voice of God. And faith will save you then from evil times. The evil influence of time can break a person's life, after which it will be very difficult to get back on your feet when fate has knocked you down.
But if during this difficult period a person remembers God, hears the voice of God, in this case they undoubtedly overcome their fate. Why should we be reminded that the sun will rise, the sun will rise so often because we don't believe in it? Therefore, we need to repeat many times that it's not the quarantine that will be extended, but the sun will rise, the sun will rise, and the quarantine will cease to exist. Don't think that the quarantine will be extended and the coronavirus will never be defeated. Everyone will be chipped. Don't listen to this. Don't repeat it. This means aging. Youth is when people believe in the best and enjoy life. They believe that everything will be fine, that it's possible to live during quarantine. How many good internal deeds can be done when God doesn't let you out on the street and doesn't allow you to do deeds externally? Being on the balcony, you start to appreciate nature much more than while being in the forest. Living in nature, in the forest, you stop appreciating it, but when your nature is a balcony, then you begin to experience a very strong love for nature. And imagine how happy people will be when they are let out and can get to the forest. I'm sure many will want to start running. Everyone will be told, for example, that walking on the streets is not allowed, but running in the park for health benefits is allowed, and everyone will run to the park. Let's say guards or police are walking around. A person seeing them immediately starts running. No police, no need to run. In this case, the coronavirus pandemic would be a wonderful period. Just imagine, you can't just walk on the streets, but you can run in the park. They'd better introduce even more laws. For example, you can't eat meat, you can't leave your wife. During the coronavirus infection, you can only live with her. During the coronavirus infection, implement a law allowing only running on the streets, but not walking. For example, you want to go outside, then run. A person will immediately change into sportswear and run outside for fresh air. If they introduce such laws, it would be great. You can't watch TV during the pandemic because scientists have discovered that coronavirus is transmitted through TV and computer screens. Moreover, through the computer, the virus is transmitted not to the lungs, but to the brain. It makes the brain coronavirus infected. The signs of coronavirus infection in the brain are complaining. When a person constantly complains and whines, it's a clear sign that the coronavirus has infected their brain. Why are there mass riots in America? Why are people destroying everything and killing each other? There are such cases. It's difficult to calculate the force when catching a criminal. For example, during an arrest, the criminal resisted. They hit them on the head, and this person died. Or a person was strangled, they miscalculated the force, and the person died. Of course, it's unpleasant when a person asked to be released but was strangled. As a result, the person died. It's an unpleasant thing. But why are there such mass riots? People don't know how to live an inner life. They don't know how to properly stay in self-isolation. They all were outraged, and these riots began then spread to Sweden, Germany. What do these Americans have to do with it? There aren't even black people there, but they still go out on the streets and protest. Why? Because it's just an excuse. It's just an excuse. But in reality, the reason is, you're only guilty because I want to eat. As the lamb asked the wolf, why do you want to eat me? What am I guilty of? The wolf thought and didn't know what to say and finally said, you're only guilty because I want to eat. And here it's the same with all these riots. This coronavirus infection has penetrated people's minds. This is aging. Aging means non-acceptance of life. This is life on earth nowadays, and you should accept it and be happy with it. Live joyfully this life. People were happy going into attack during the World War. World wars happen. You can't escape anywhere. There's war everywhere. And they were happy, joyfully went into attack, singing such beautiful songs. Such beautiful songs. People enjoyed life in the face of death. This is the right way of life when even during war, people still rejoice. And it's very beautiful to be joyful during trials. Is this called life or youth? Youth means that a person can cope with difficulties and overcome them. And if a person overcomes difficulties even in old age, then they are still young. You'll say, Dr. Torsunov, we actually came to the lecture to learn how to make our face look younger. All right, if you want to know that. You're beating around the bush, Dr. Torsunov. Let's talk specifically about the face. I want a younger face, Dr. Torsunov. What does all this have to do with it? What's the point? Okay, about the face. There are also three types of aging on the face. There can be excess heat, tension, and excess weight. These are acne pimples. If there's acne pimples, then you need to eat less in the evenings. Specifically, eat less sweets and pastry in the evenings, and acne pimples will disappear. Acne pimples mean that fat is trying to come out through the face. It can no longer remain inside. Pus is simply coming out because you eat incorrectly. When a person eats a lot of sweets in the evening, all these toxins are released during the night. For some people, toxins go to the throat, provoking tonsillitis. For others, to the nose, causing runny nose. For some, to the eyes. They wake up with pus in their eyes, and for some, to the face. So it's different for everyone, depending on how lucky they are, how fate acts. 
therefore how to get rid of a sore throat in the morning, runny nose, watery eyes. Dr. Torsunov, when will you send your bracelets to prevent infection? You simply need to eat less sweets and pastry in the evening, and then you won't need any bracelets. All this comes out on your face because you're leading an incorrect lifestyle. That's it. That's the advice. You can cover these pimples with cream, squeeze them, but it still doesn't help. These pimples will still keep coming out, and then the face will look like a tractor went over it. You understand? The only way is to eat less sweets and pastry in the evening. You'll say, Dr. Torsunov, I can't. Okay, put a lock on the refrigerator and give the key to your husband. If you can't do it yourself, let someone else help you control the situation somehow. You're trying to make it open but can't. It's locked. Just like you hide candies from children because they can't control the situation themselves. So you need to do something about it somehow if knowledge doesn't help you and you need sweets in the evening. You'll say, but Dr. Torsunov, why do I want sweets? You see, we delve into the topic. We started with pimples. Let's move on. Why do you want sweets in the evening? One wants sweets in the evening because a person eats away their resentments, their tension this way. Sweet food is pure goodness food. Pure goodness means positive, optimistic. So why does a person want to eat sweets in the evening? Because this way they eat away their tension, their resentment, their depression, their disappointment. And you'll say, does this mean sweets are bad? But it's pure goodness food. No, sweets are good. Therefore, another way to solve the issue is to understand that there are pure goodness sweets and there are non-pure goodness ones. Non-pure goodness sweets lower energy downwards. For example, cake, pastries, they all lower energy downwards in the evening, but there are pure goodness sweets and they raise energy upwards. These are dried fruits, honey, raisins, but you don't want to eat these sweets, you need cake, because you see, your goal is not optimism, but simply calming down so that energy goes down. What's the goal of eating cake? You eat cake and just become dull. This state means happiness for you. So it turns out everything depends on what you perceive as happiness. If you perceive happiness as simply being in a good mood, serving your husband, caring, loving everyone, then eat dried fruits in the evening. It turns out you can have dried fruits in the evening. You can have honey. You can have dried fruits. Imagine you can eat sweet dates in the evening. You can have honey. You can have dried fruits. You can't have cake because honey and dried fruits are pure goodness sweets. They raise energy upwards. And if you simply eat a lot of dried fruits in the evening, you'll be agitated if you don't give this energy to your relatives. You won't even be able to fall asleep. You'll be very active until one in the morning rejoicing while everyone is already asleep at this time, which is also not good. So if you've eaten honey or dried fruits in the evening, then you need to understand what will happen next. You need to rejoice in everyone, love everyone, lift everyone's mood, and then go to bed. Sometimes a person is so tired, they're so depressed, they eat dried fruits and honey in the evening, their mood improves, they relax and go to sleep. This also happens. We figured out about the pimples. Pimples also indicate heat. The energy of pimples is kapha. That means excess weight, toxins, and heat. Therefore, if pimples are coming out, you should know that heat and kapha in the body rise towards the evening. That's why evening nutrition is crucial. If pimples are coming out, there are sweets that simultaneously cool the body and raise energy upwards. These are apples, pears, bananas, persimmons. If you have acne pimples on your face, then eat apples, pears, persimmons. Oranges, tangerines are not allowed in the evening. You can't have fruits that give heat to the face. You need those that cool. I've named these for you. For instance, sweets like raisins will give heat to the face. Or sometimes prunes can give heat to some people, but not to everyone. Dried apricots can give heat to some people, but not to everyone. Dried or fresh apples and pears always cool the body. Dried and fresh bananas always cool. What else for those people who have acne? It's water fasting. If a person fasts, all their acne is simply consumed by the body. The whole face is cleansed thanks to fasting. What else? It's swimming. Contact with still water. Not with a shower, but with still water. You can lie in a bath. In what kind of bath? A warm bath. Even though it's warm, it generally cools the body. If a person lies in a warm bath in the evenings, their face also becomes cleaner because the body cools down. It seems like you've been lying in warm water, but you are cold. You feel chilly afterwards because the body has cooled down. We are talking about the fact that if you have some element predominating in your face, then do the opposite things. Let's say dryness predominates in your face. If your face or skin is constantly dry, you should apply a few drops of oil to your wet body in the morning after a shower. There are only three types of rejuvenating oils. Most often coconut oil is suitable for people. Coconut is an oil that simultaneously relaxes and cools. If the skin is hot and tense, then coconut oil will be suitable. You need to apply it to the whole body, including the hair. It's better not to apply oil to intimate areas, breasts and groin, because these are hot zones in the body. 
they can overheat from the oil. It's also better not to apply too much to the neck. You can apply oil to all other areas, the whole body, and then you go to the shower again and dry yourself with a towel. Only the smell remains from the oil because we rub in very little, just a few drops on the body. It rubs well on the wet body. Then we go to the shower again and dry ourselves with a towel, and only the smell of the oil remains. This smell from the oil will heal the skin. If a person has dry skin, then coconut oil will moisturize the skin and remove heat from it. The next two types of oil are suitable for those whose skin is not overheating, but just drying out. These are clarified butter ghee and sesame oil. Sesame oil is especially suitable for those who have very dry skin and who feel cold. If a person has dry skin and feels cold, then sesame oil is most suitable for them. If a person has dry skin and overheats, then coconut oil is suitable for them. And if a person has dry skin and doesn't feel cold or overheat, then clarified butter is suitable. It should also be known that clarified butter is suitable for all small children. This is because a newborn child naturally has dry skin. They lived in a liquid environment for a long time. There was liquid around them. After birth, there is no liquid around them anymore, so the baby's skin is always dry. And to help newborn children in this regard, you need to apply a thin layer of clarified butter after bathing. Then children stop being bothered by gas in the stomach, colic, and abdominal pain. When children cry, it is most often caused by abdominal pain because there is increased dryness in the body. That means that oiling the skin is a rule that increases life expectancy. With age after 40 years, all people need to oil their skin in this way. Apply a very thin layer of oil to the body in the morning after a shower. You should spread a few drops of oil over the body, then rinse them with warm water and wipe yourself. After 40 years, you need to choose one of three oils, either coconut or light sesame. There is also dark sesame, it is not suitable, or clarified butter. You need to choose one of these three oils and oil your skin with a thin layer early in the morning after a shower for the rest of your life. Then hair will become thicker and better and will fall out less. I mean here on the head. Ladies, don't think that hair will start growing everywhere if you oil your entire body. No, just the hair on your head will grow better, and where it doesn't grow, it won't grow. Oiling the body gives youthfulness to the skin. It is preserved better. You don't need to invent any special creams for this because nature has already invented everything. Oil has a hot, fiery energy. However, at the same time, there are oils that have fiery energy but are created from cold products. Milk is a cold, cooling product. The oil from this product is hot, but it cools at the same time. Oils that are hot but cool rejuvenate a person. Coconut palm, coconut, is a cooling product, and even though the oil from it is fiery, it is still cooling. Sesame is also a cooling product. Sesame seeds have a cooling effect, and the oil from them is a hot product, but at the same time cooling. In other words, when two qualities of fire and cold combine, you get a rejuvenating product. These three oils that I mentioned rejuvenate a person. You won't find any others in nature. And oiling should be done in the morning because in the evening the human body naturally heats up. In the morning it is naturally cold, so you should oil your body only in the morning. This increases the youthfulness of the skin. Being in water also increases the youthfulness of the skin. And being in water increases life expectancy in general. Therefore people should learn to adjust and love warm baths in the evenings, especially with age. Bathhouse or sauna is also a rejuvenation thing, so it's important to learn how to use it correctly. Staying in a sauna is a whole science. If you do it the wrong way, you reduce life expectancy. And if you do it right, you increase it. There is only one correct option. At first, you come into contact with either coolness or cold. That depends on your level of hardening. Then you come into contact with warmth. Warmth is not dry steam, but either moist or very moist. It can be either a Russian bathhouse or a Turkish steam sauna. But the Finnish sauna is not for health, it just tones, because the air is dry, hot, and very high temperature there. If you want to improve your health, then you should visit either a Turkish steam sauna or a Russian sauna. Russian sauna means that the temperature is quite high and there is not so much steam. And Turkish sauna means a lot of steam and lower temperature. Choose what suits you best. First you need cool or cold water, you have to stay in it for quite a long time. Then the steam room, and then you finish with water again. During the bath, you can't eat or drink anything except water or herbal tea. Remember it? Also, in the steam room, you need to be very careful with all aromatic oils or better not to use them at all. Because aromatic oils are also a heating thing. If you use aromatic oil in a hot bath, it additionally heats and can cause some kind of breakdown in the body. Therefore, you need to be very careful with these things. Aromatic oils during the steam room are a mistake. But herbs are the opposite. If you spray herb decoctions on the steam, or if from the steam generator comes herbal steam, then it relaxes. 
It's best to steam on stone, like in a Turkish steam sauna, or on wood from trees such as linden and aspen. The sauna should be made of linden and aspen. For example, pine is not suitable for a sauna. It's a hot wood. It tones. The sauna also rejuvenates because it removes two of the three energies of aging. It removes excess weight, tension in the body, and heat. Also, cool water removes heat from the body. The steam room in the sauna removes excess weight. Both water and the steam room remove tension. So both water and the steam room remove tension, the steam room removes excess weight, and water removes heat. Therefore, be careful in the sauna. The main mistake is that people only steam in the sauna and don't cool down. And then they feel good, they're relaxed, but the next day their digestion worsens, they feel heaviness in the head, drowsiness, they feel bad the next day. This means that they use the sauna the wrong way. The right way is first cold, then heat, then cold again. This is correct, even though it is an asceticism practice. If you don't want to go into the cold before the sauna, go to a cooler place at least. So it's approximately like this. They make jacuzzis in modern saunas now. It's warm. Warm water and a steam room and nothing else. This is idiocy. That means you need a cool pool and a steam room. This is not idiocy. Or let's say there's no pool in Siberia. Just go outside and stand in the frost. That's fine too. You went outside, stood in the frost, then came back into the steam room. Excellent. Or dive into an ice hole, into an icy river. I remember in Krasnoyarsk, we went to the sauna right on the bank of the Yenisei River, the river in Krasnoyarsk. There is a sauna right on the bank of the Yenisei. We stayed in the steam sauna and went into the water. And I always come there in late autumn. The Yenisei River doesn't freeze even in winter. Geese are swimming there. And these geese laugh at us when we go into the river. We can only go in for a few seconds. During this time, geese are swimming nearby. They laugh at us. Because it's normal for them, they're swimming. And you're like a fool. You get in. You get out. You can't stand the cold water. You can't bear it. They're cracking up at us, laughing. This rejuvenates everything. Contact with icy water rejuvenates. Contact with the steam room rejuvenates. Wet steam is better than dry. We're talking with you about rejuvenation. What else rejuvenates the face? What rejuvenates the face? Face massage, smoothing massage with cream. You also need to learn to choose creams correctly. They all should cool your face. This is a hot zone, therefore all face creams should be slightly cooling. They should remove excess heat from the face. Face masks should be cooling, but not too much. If the mask has a cooling element and an oily element, then together this brings health. Masks associated with clay. Clay is a hot product. And which clay is healing? The one that cools. It means blue clay. The blue color cools. Why do we need clay? Clay removes oil and acne from the face. It removes oil from the face and something else. But you're going to plug your ears now, because you'd better not hear this. Fresh cow manure removes oil and fire from the face simultaneously. It rejuvenates the face. It removes acne, wrinkles. It's both oily and cooling at the same time, and it removes dead skin. Cow manure works as a scrub. Don't like it fresh? You can use dried. If you dilute it in water, it doesn't smell bad anymore. You can apply it and use a mask made of cow manure. And there's something even cooler. If you combine dried cow manure with a small amount of clarified butter and add a small amount of milk to it, milk, clarified butter, and cow manure, and put it all together on the face, such a mixture will rejuvenate even better. But don't tell anyone about this because then they write on the internet that Dr. Torsenov advised smearing shit on the face. By the way, the Russian word govno, or shit, in English is translated from Sanskrit like this. Go means cow in Sanskrit. Go is a cow. And govno is indeed cow manure, because it's a product of the cow, go. Like another Russian word, govyadina. It is beef in English. We know that beef is related to cows, right? Go is a cow. Vyadina is its meat. Govyadina. Similarly, govno is cow manure. But now we perceive it is bad. But in ancient culture, it was perceived well. They smeared cow manure on the walls and on the floor in the dwelling. Because cow manure keeps away evil spirits, and it cools. It creates a pleasant coolness for the mind. I know one holy person, his whole house is covered with a 10 centimeter layer of cow manure, and it's all dried. Both walls and ceiling are covered. When I entered his room, I immediately relaxed and calmed down. In spite of the fact that it was in India, in the heat, it was cool at that time in his room. It's a unique feeling. And it doesn't smell bad at all, it just smells fresh. Therefore, cow manure is considered a pure product. It purifies the space. But this part of the lecture should not be copied or recorded by anyone because people criticize me the most for this. Then they find some fools to film. They made such a film about 10 years ago. They found fools who eat manure and drink cow urine and say, Dr. Torsenov taught us all this. 
Here's a movie like this. They don't actually film me there. I don't advise this, but they just say it like that. They pass on such knowledge. I advise using it externally. Why, if nothing else helps you. For example, if you have acne on your skin, you can try this remedy. In general, cow manure is a healing thing. I saved several people from death with cow manure when I lived in India. Do you know that people faint there? A person just goes from their home to the store in the heat at 55 degrees. On the way, they get sunstroke and faint. At this time, if you see how it happened, you should smear them with fresh cow manure. They regain consciousness instantly, and there are no consequences of sunstroke. If you smear them later, when they've been lying there for a while, they won't regain consciousness instantly. But you can still save their life then. I've had this happen to me a few times. Cow manure has tremendous cooling power. It's actually the most cooling product on earth, and it cools gently. Evil spirits are also energy of heat. When a person feels spirits, they have some voices inside. This is the energy of heat inside. When a person is smeared with cow manure, it can also ease the mental connection. Remove this heat. Remove contact with all spirits. I'm telling you this as a theory. You don't have to go around like savages smeared in this cow manure now. I'm just telling you that there's blue clay. It acts approximately the same as cow manure, clay, blue clay, or white clay. But white clay can dry a little bit. White may be suitable for those with oily skin. But blue clay, it both cools and doesn't dry. And this clay is the most useful of all types of clay. So why do we need clay? To remove all acne from the face. So rejuvenation of the face means to act in the opposite way. If the face is hot, you should cool it. If there's acne, you should cleanse it. If the face is tense, it means you should lubricate it with oil that doesn't overheat. And then your skin will stay young. If you neutralize the energies of aging with some external means, then you will remain young. At best, we will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven, as the song goes. Because they might say, the kingdom of heaven is yours, but you go someplace else. The most interesting thing is seeing what happens in the end. What awaits us at the end, this is the most important, the most interesting thing. We need some kind of goal. The goal should not be simple. It should be very serious. Some people seek benefits. Well, if you're looking for benefits, let's talk about it. You want to be a rich person? Is it beneficial? Very much. Okay, but will you take the money with you further? No, we are born naked, we leave naked. What's the benefit? If you, let's say, invest in your heart, for example, you learn to be honest, will you take it with you? Yes. In the next life, you'll be born honest. Let's say you learn to do good deeds. You do a good deed, and this good deed goes with you to the next life. It's called devoutness. A person is born beautiful, let's say. They have kind speech. They have a good birth, a good family, intelligent, a good country a good place where they were born, all this as a result of good deeds. You invest good deeds in your life, you do good deeds, what's the result? You become rich. Rich means God gave you a lot. In Russian, the word rich comes from the word God. There is such a mentality to make a lot of money in this life. Some people are earning and earning money. They already don't know how to spend it. They've built a stadium inside their house. What else to do with this money? That means a person did good deeds in their past life, so God gave them a lot of money to make many people happy, to teach many people, feed many poor people, build schools, do good deeds. Wealth is given for good deeds. But instead, this person built several submarines for own needs. How else to spend money? What to do with it? If you don't use money where you should, you'll be responsible for it in your next life. This is the main problem, you understand. People don't understand that they have to answer for everything. It's better to strive for higher things. If you strive for God, say a prayer every day, do good. You will never make a mistake. There will be some minor errors, but you won't be responsible for them very much. But if you have the wrong goal in life, this is where the trap comes. Of course, it may not happen. A person can earn a lot of money and spend it all serving God. Then they will become even richer in the next life. God will give even more opportunities and so on to infinity. Money is not the problem. The problem is the wrong goal in life. If a person is loiter, they don't know what they live for, they can't be young. And if they live a long life, it's only a curse. Some people just howl about living long because they don't know why. Most people think you should live to enjoy. Enjoy only in youth. If I'm already old, why can't I die? People ask, Lord, take me away, I can't take it anymore, it's so hard. It means people don't understand why they live. But if a person prays to God, serves him every day, helps everyone in this world, lives so that God rejoices every second, such a person can live 150 years... Because if this person leaves this life and is born again in this world, then at first they won't understand anything. Then it will take 20 years to learn, to figure out where they are going. 20 years of life are already lost. Then if they have favorable conditions. 
Let's say they were born in a communist country. You can't talk about God there, and it's also very difficult to serve God. In other words, unfavorable living conditions. People are often born in such countries. They can't even pray because it's not allowed. Of course, they have inclinations. They do good deeds, love everyone, treat everyone kindly. God likes this too. You can somehow serve God without a temple and without prayer. But you need to understand that this is a risk. It's a risk to be born again in this world. A risk. Therefore, it's better to live longer and do more for God to purify yourself more and then go to spiritual reality. So should you live longer? Yes. The question is, for what purpose? You know some people spend whole days thinking only about how to live longer. For example, I often meet people who have these delusional ideas like a raw food diet or something else. I'm not against a raw food diet. This diet is a good thing. It helps some people. Just don't think about food constantly. Once I met a raw foodist and he started talking to me. I said, can we talk about something else besides food? He ate a tomato and is thinking of a carrot. He is going to eat it in an hour. But you have to live now until you eat the carrot. And it's hard. Because I'm a raw foodist, I can't eat everything at once, like people usually do. You have to eat a little bit at a time. The same goes for separate diets. If you ate a tomato, you would think about a carrot. When you ate a carrot, you would think about an apple and so on all day. So you are thinking all the time about food. What did you live for? If you live to eat carrots and apples, well, no problem. You'll be born in an animal body. Rabbits are also raw foodists. They only eat raw food. And you'll be running around all day and thinking, Where's the carrot that I need to eat? Then you'll eat the carrot. Where's the radish that I need to eat? This is an animal body. It is a very healthy body, a vegetarian body. But there's no use in it. You don't achieve a higher goal. Therefore, how you eat is secondary. The main thing is what you live for. If you live to eat apples and carrots all day and only think about your health, then what's this life for? You're working for the body. You don't know that you are a soul. That's the problem. We need to understand what we live for. If we always think only about health, only about carrots, apples, and exercises, then you'll die healthy. But what did you live for? That's the question. This is the most important thing, and it's also embedded within us. If a person knows the most important thing, they can live very long and happily because they have a purpose. If we talk about longevity, the first thing to understand is the purpose. It begins and ends with this. If a person deeply understands the purpose, what he is fighting for, he won't be killed in war. Why? Because he will have a very deep faith, a goal, and this goal will save him. He will feel the bullets, will dodge, bend down in time. Why? Because he will be protected by the purpose. If a person has a focus in life, they will live. Let me give you an example. A man lives, then suddenly has a heart attack. Something happened to him. Will he live or not? There's only one answer. If there is some great reason, God will help him live. If there's no great reason, say goodbye. Why does God save some in these seconds and others not? Because there are no reasons. I have an acquaintance. He bought himself a defective car and drove it for the first time in heavy rain. He lost control on a turn and drove into the oncoming lane. Then a big truck hit him at full speed right in the front of the car. The front of the car flew off to the side immediately because it was cut off by this impact, and the car flew into the oncoming lane where it was at first, and two other cars hit the back of it. One ripped off another piece of the car, and the other added more damage. What do you think? Could a person survive in such a crash or not? The car was in shreds. At full speed, the car was hit three times. Could a driver survive? You'd say, no. And the police who arrived also said, where are the bodies? No one could have survived. But this man had a purpose in life. He lived for God. And therefore, when God saw all this, he showed him how he protects him. He had a vision, as if God put him in some kind of shell. As a result, the place where he was sitting was not damaged and was not touched. When this person regained consciousness, he was taken to intensive care, x-rayed, and not a single fracture was found. He got only a couple of bruises. After two days, he already left the hospital on his own feet. Then after two days in Sochi, there was a small car accident. Two people died. In the first case, there was a big accident, but the person survived. In the second, a small accident and two people died. They died, even though there wasn't really any serious crash. Why did in one case God give life to a person and in the other not? Because when it doesn't make sense, there's no reason to live, no need to live. If there's no reason to live, what's the point of saving someone's life? God gives life if there is a serious purpose. It's very important to know. And he also gives knowledge about how to live. Knowledge that fresh air helps to live. Almost no one knows this. Everyone thinks that dietary supplements or Herbalife help to live. Nature helps a person to live. This knowledge is given to a person if they believe in some great meaning of this life. They also understand how to live long if there is a purpose. If there's no purpose, why live a long life? Why? 
There's a parable. A student asked a wise man, a mentor, tell me please, in what cases should one live long? In what cases should one not live long? In what cases should a person die faster by themselves? And in which cases should they preserve their lives? And the wise man began to explain. He began to explain that if a person is a monk, he has a monastic lifestyle, and he is young and strong, has a lot of health and strength, and he is very strongly purifying his existence. He has achieved perfection. He has completely purified his heart. He is still young. He needs to die faster because in old age it will be harder for him to purify his life. He might slip up. He might make some mistakes and lose his purity and asceticism practice because of this. So if a person has achieved life perfection at a young age, the spiritual mentor said that it's better for him to die faster. It's hard for us to understand because this is high philosophy. For example, a person is a king. He rules the world. He doesn't rule very properly, not very well. It's better for such a person to live longer because if he doesn't improve himself, doesn't do what will correct his mistakes, then in the next life he will suffer greatly because each mistake means the suffering of thousands and thousands of people and the king will have to suffer too for this. Therefore, for a king who rules the kingdom wrongly, it's better to live longer because he can have enough brains to change everything and gain opportunities so that God will give him a good life again. Now, as a wise man says, if a person works in a slaughterhouse and kills innocent animals for no reason, it's not good for this person to live a long life, nor to die. Because if he lives long, they will accumulate many sins in his body and endure a long stay in hell afterwards. And if he dies now, then he will go straight to hell. That means that, in essence, such a person finds themselves in a situation where neither living nor dying seems favorable. It's best to change their lifestyle and then think about life or death. Understand this, it's always varied. Sometimes God takes the life of a holy person sooner, while other times he grants a person a long life. Sometimes he doesn't intervene at all. If they live, they live. If not, they don't. It doesn't matter to them. But there is a principle. If a person grasps the highest purpose of their life and the value of human birth, God will ensure they live longer. He will provide the knowledge needed to prolong their life. I'm giving you this knowledge now. If you are wise, you will listen. The knowledge reveals that life is extended when one has a clear understanding of human life's purpose. Such an understanding of purpose brings God's protection. He will safeguard your life to the maximum. It happens that God wants to take a close follower somewhere else, and when God decides this, there is no need to worry. Death itself is frightening when one does not know the future. However, to his devotees, God reveals what awaits them, and this knowledge brings them happiness at the moment of passing away. It is an infinite happiness unlike the happiness as we imagine it. I've witnessed such departures from life. A holy person who had liver cancer is an example. As he neared the moment of passing away, he said to his wife, Someone is calling me, hand me the phone. She gave it to him. He took it and said, Hello, yes, my spiritual teacher, I understood everything. Thank you very much. His wife, confused, said, But no one called you. Who were you speaking to? He replied, My spiritual teacher called me. Even though his teacher had already passed away, he insisted that his teacher spoke to him. When asked what was said, he answered, Tomorrow at this time, get ready. I will take you to the spiritual realm. His wife assumed he was hallucinating and didn't understand what was happening. The next day at the same time, he called his wife and said, Wife, come here. She says, What is it? He says, Look around at the beauty. He was in a holy place, seeing something extraordinary as he was passing away. She looked around and said, Well, it is all as usual. She turned to him and saw that he had already passed away with such a radiant, joyful gaze, having seen this unearthly beauty. He transitioned to the spiritual realm. This is how people transition to the spiritual realm, leaving with a happy gaze and a smile. God shows them why he is taking them and where. I had another case when a young woman approached me. It's an interesting case. God showed me many interesting things. So she said, My father, who is very elevated and a revered spiritual mentor to many, says that has lymph node cancer. And he has metastases in his head. He's lying unconscious. Maybe you can help him somehow. Maybe you can cure him or ease his life somehow. I didn't refuse. She asked me very sincerely, so I decided to do something. I wasn't sure I could help. I started applying bark from different trees to his body. Tree bark can have an effect as it has cleansing energy. It can cleanse the body. If the energy of the bark aligns with the energy of the tumor, the tumor may start to dissolve. This doesn't mean that any bark can dissolve any tumor. But if there is a match... It can have an amazing effect. God gave me an opportunity to see it working in this situation. I don't treat malignant tumors now. But at that moment, God gave me an opportunity to see how the dissolution occurs. A lymph node tumor grows quickly and dissolves quickly. Within days, under the influence of this bark, two metastases in his brain dissolved. 
and he regained consciousness. He began to understand everything. He regained clear consciousness and started communicating with me. A lymph node tumor can be directly on the body. There are all kinds of lymph nodes, including in the underarms. I saw in just one day his lymph node disappeared. The tumors, they're big, like lumps. Suddenly the lump was gone. It disappeared completely. And then another one, in a different place. I could see these dissolving. I shared this with him, saying, Look how quickly everything is dissolving. You'll recover soon. And he answered me interestingly. He just calmly said to me, I don't know what the Lord wants, whether he wants to take me or he wants to leave me here. Therefore, I don't know if I'll recover or not. It all depends on his will. I was so surprised. Usually people celebrate at the prospect of recovery and say, Hooray, I'll recover. No one reasons on this topic, but this person did, and he prayed. A couple more weeks passed. When I came to visit him again, he even started walking again and visiting the temple. That means he was able to walk quite far. He started to feel much better. Despite all that, he told me that day, God wants to take me to the spiritual world. God doesn't want to leave me here, so you can treat me, of course you can continue, but I will be preparing to pass away. At that moment, he had no sadness or melancholy. He was cheerful and happy. This experience once again shows that if someone passes away in deep happiness, they enter the spiritual realm, or at least paradise. Death itself is not sorrowful if a person has lived a righteous life. Moreover, passing away in the spiritual sense isn't truly death. When a person transitions to the spiritual world, death does not come. Death occurs when someone transitions to material reality. For those entering the spiritual realm, angels come for them instead of death. Death does not come for such a person because death only comes to take a person to God's judgment. If a person doesn't need God's judgment, then why would death come for them? Angels come and take this person instead. So, this person told me to continue treating him. I demanded, I insisted, saying, I must complete your treatment. I don't believe I should stop it. And he says, well, keep treating. A few days later, I applied the bark, and he gets worse. I apply it this way and that, and he just gets worse, simply worse. I realized I couldn't treat him anymore. It was as if a door had closed. Because when I apply the bark, he immediately feels worse. We stopped the treatment. A few days later, he announced his departure date. On that day, he gathered many people, his friends, and started a prayer session chanting God's holy name. It went on for many hours, 12, 16 hours. He gathered all the people during the day, and they all started singing continuously. He said, I will soon pass away. You need to continue. When it begins to dawn and the night passes its middle, this period is considered a favorable time to leave the body after one o'clock in the morning. He passed away with open eyes and filled with happiness, showing that he transitioned to spiritual reality. That means passing away itself is not something bad. It can be wonderful even if it happens prematurely. This person passed away at around 60, which is considered premature by today's standards. We live too little. People used to live much longer before. Even 5,000 years ago, people lived 170, 180 years on average. The scriptures describe that people used to live to 180 years old, and even earlier, 10,000 years ago, they lived for 300, 400 years. This is mentioned in the Bible. It is said that people had a much longer lifespan, up to 800 or even 1,000 years. People used to live for a long time. But now we only live for 80 to 90 years, which is considered the maximum and already impressive. Why is that? It's because the atmosphere has deteriorated. Firstly, we don't practice asceticism and we lead unhealthy lifestyles. The environment and ecology are poor. Even more so, it's the ecology of thoughts. People carry a lot of negativity. The food we eat is also bad. When humans interfere with food and try to modify it, life expectancy shortens. The best food is that which grows naturally on its own. If it grew on its own by God's will, it's good food. When we meddle with it, we reduce our lifespan. So who needs the knowledge of how to live long? Those who live for the sake of understanding God. And God grants this knowledge in the heart. I will tell you how to live long. For this, you need to live with joy and practice asceticism and love nature because nature gives the energy of health. Today, when I did yoga, my back felt really stiff. I mentally drew the energy of the sun and sent it to my back. Suddenly, at that moment, the tension eased and the cleansing continued. When it became difficult again, I sent more of the sun's energy to my back again. So, with the help of the energy of the sun, I cleansed my entire back and I felt better. You should carry this knowledge in your heart. If you have a joyful and strong attitude towards nature, it will heal you. If you fear it, it will cripple you. But for the sun to heal you, you need to be strong. I trained tried running, 
When I had been running for a long time, I ran in bright sunlight and watched how the sun cleansed me. The sun can also cleanse energy channels in your body. But cleansing with the sun is the most difficult. If you can't handle it, don't expose yourself directly to the open sun. You might suffer. Cleansing by the sun is possible if you can run for a long time without being overwhelmed by the sun. After exposure to the sun, you must always stay in water for a long time to let the steam come out of your body. You can cleanse yourself with the sun, but you still need to cool down afterwards. There is specific knowledge about how this heals. The sun gives a person infinite immunity and the ability to overcome life's obstacles. The sun essentially dissolves obstacles. It dissolves the energy of obstacles. The sun provides immunity, strong digestion, endless optimism, and gives a person a solid status. For men, the sun enhances masculine beauty. That means the ability to influence the situation. A man becomes very influential, successful, and famous. The energy of the sun acts like this. The sun gives such strength. For women, the sun brings beauty, a strong, radiant beauty. A sunny girl is a beautiful girl. Beauty is her form of influence. But who does the sun give strength to? It gives strength only to those who defend justice in this world, because the sun is the embodiment of justice. The energy of the sun is the energy of justice. Therefore, one who goes against good is not following the sun. Follow the sun, even if this path is unknown. Go, my friend. Always go on the path of goodness, because if the sun heals you, gives you strength, and makes you happy, it means your life is heading in the right direction. You are walking the path of goodness. But for those who choose the path of evil, the sun becomes hostile to them. It doesn't give them strength or joy. Instead, it makes them angry. The energy of the sun angers these people. They become wrathful. Their faces turn red. Everything inside them gets inflamed. The sun cripples these people. It gives energy that destroys their lives. Incorrect thinking is to blame for this. Sometimes, due to fate, the sun occupies a hostile position in a person's horoscope. In my horoscope, for example, the sun occupies a hostile position. In my past life, I was a bad guy. I did some bad things, and God punished me with a hostile position of the sun in my horoscope. But it doesn't mean that the sun will torment me for the rest of my life. I have no option but to avoid anger. If I get a little angry, I immediately overheat and can't sleep at night. This means that the sun is hostile. It reminds me, you don't have the luxury of getting angry anymore. You will be held accountable for this. So I try not to get angry, and as a result, I don't get sick. I don't overheat because I live correctly. The hostile sun doesn't bother me. On the contrary, it's becoming more friendly as I age. The older I get, the longer I can be in the sun, and it doesn't overwhelm me. It used to overload me because I had more sins. Now I have fewer sins, so I can spend more time in the sun without feeling overloaded. The sun is always friendly to a person. Live rightly, do good deeds, and the sun will support you. The energy of air supports you as well. This is the energy of prana. It gives a person the strength to live. Even the communists knew this. We should know this even more. If communists live for the sake of people, live for a higher purpose to bring happiness to people, God likes this. God doesn't care if people acknowledge him or not, whether they serve him or not. He still grants them knowledge of how to be healthy if their goals are righteous, even to communists. You can receive this knowledge as long as you have the right goals in life. If you aim to serve people and care for everyone, God will grant you knowledge because he likes it. This is the knowledge of how to live long. Everyone can become younger if they take a sip of cheerful wind. Here it is, the knowledge that every person can become younger if they take a sip of cheerful wind. I remember the last time in Germany there was a storm when I arrived and I needed to run that day. I had to run 16 kilometers. There was a storm and trees were falling right over because of the wind. But we ran anyway, weaving around these fallen trees. And we noticed it was amazing to see how nature works. First, there was the wind. When you're running, the wind can become helpful and really heal you. If you're running and you notice that the wind is light and happy, not harsh, you take a sip of this joyful wind. Come on, cheerful wind, sing us a song. Cheerful wind. Cheerful means it brings good health. And it was indeed cheerful because it was even knocking down trees. That's how strong this cheerful wind was. We kept running and running. And you know what we noticed? We were two people running together. We noticed that as we ran, the wind would calm down where we were. Ahead of us, it was still roaring and toppling trees. But when we reached this spot, there would be no wind. The wind would become much weaker, not as strong. It wasn't blowing us away. We would run away and the wind would pick up again in that place. I directly saw how the Lord was shielding us. We were running, just running, and the Lord was protecting us. In the area where we were running, the wind wasn't knocking down trees. Also, at the end of our run, the Lord showed us a deer. 
We were running, and we saw two beautiful deer crossing the road. It was just stunning with all the trees around, and God had swept the leaves for us. There were dry leaves piled probably a meter and a half high. He had swept such a carpet of leaves. As we ran into this pile, it felt like we were diving into a soft feather bed. I suddenly understood what the scriptures meant when they said ancient people, yogis, would sleep on leaves, sleeping on leaves just like on a feather bed. I thought, how could that be? Leaves as a feather bed, really? But it's true, if you have a pile of dry leaves a meter and a half high, when you lie down on them, it feels just like a feather bed. Your back doesn't get cold, it's not cold at all, it's warm on them, and very comfortable. I'm lying amidst the blowing wind, deer are all around, and it's just great, such a great state, when the elements of nature are raging, and everyone with wide eyes is running away from there, from this forest, but I don't care. Why? Because God protects, I feel in my heart that he wants us to live for us to continue doing good deeds, and the Lord protects. He doesn't let us perish. He gives knowledge on how to deal with danger. I often fly on planes. It's very dangerous. God gives knowledge on how to pray, how to set oneself up for the plane not to crash. He gives a choice of which plane to board and which not to. He gives knowledge in the heart. The Lord protects your life. You can live long if your life has great value, and if it has no value, then what's the difference? Why should he worry? If you live just for the sake of living, God treats your life the same way. If you're unlucky, you die. If you're lucky, you live. It's not that he's cruel. If you don't live right, I'll teach you a lesson. He's not cruel. He's kind. But he understands that we are eternal souls. We are eternal souls after all. And he understands that death is just a temporary phenomenon. A person dies and gets a new body. If a person has understood the value of their life, God will give knowledge on how to live long. You will understand, let's say, everyone is listening to a lecture, but one person starts running, working on themselves, another doesn't. Why? Because one person doesn't have the knowledge in their heart on how to live long, while the other does. When life has value for this person, they don't live in vain. They live for God, they live to serve God. Their life has great value. Why should they lose 20 years to grow up and understand everything? They need to live now and continue to live as long as possible. As long as the body can function, God will allow it to live to a person who serves God. And if God wants to take someone earlier, let's say, this person is needed somewhere else. Well, no problem. He will take them. He will tell them. He will come in a dream and say, listen, here's the thing. There's no one to give lectures on that planet. Go there. Well, okay, all right. As you say, I'll give lectures there then. There are people who can do it here. Well, I'll do it there. If God gives you another place to live, you'll be happy. You won't have any problems. But if you don't understand the value of human life, then no matter what powers you have. If you have a lot of power, you might become rich, but everything will eventually fall apart. We often look at life from a short-term perspective. We think, there are rich people, they live well, not like us. This is all temporary. And firstly, living well doesn't mean having a lot of money. God gave me the opportunity. I've communicated with different people. Rich people have a lot of problems. No one can talk to them sincerely because everyone wants their money. Everyone looks at them with greed. There's no one to even be friends with, no one to communicate with, because everyone wants something from them. They feel this from all people, and it's very hard to live like that. I've met these people, they constantly think that you want something from them. And if you don't want anything from them, it's strange to them. Why don't you want anything? It's surprising to them, and it doesn't inspire them much either. Maybe you're crazy? You don't want anything from me. If there is a meaning to life, then this meaning itself will generate in your heart the knowledge of how to live long. One person tells me, I don't understand what kind of philosophy you have. I know that quitting smoking takes a very long time. But you say that it's easy to quit smoking, drinking, and not eating meat. We talked about this. It all depends on what you live for. If you've understood the meaning of life, if a higher purpose has ignited in your heart, it will be easy for you to give up all sorts of nonsense. A person who has grasped the highest meaning of life immediately gives up everything unnecessary in life without any problems at all, without problems. There was one saint, a truly unique saint, who prayed almost constantly. He only left himself two, three hours a day for food and sleep. A very exalted holy person, his name was Haridas Thakur. He lived 500 years ago. And there was one such case. He always went to different villages and used to say, stay in your faith, just think about God, pray, dedicate your life to him. That's how he preached. He didn't try to convert anyone to his faith. He simply gave people knowledge about what to live for. That one should live for God. And he came to a new place and started chanting a prayer there. And the governor of this place didn't like him being there. 
in the forest near his place. All people came to this holy person for advice. While this governor himself was supposed to be a kind of mentor, he became envious. And he found a prostitute who was supposed to seduce this holy person. And at this time, out of nowhere, local residents came. And they said, you're a sinner, not a saint. That was the plan. And he, this holy person, is praying. The prostitute came to him, started dancing in front of him, smiling beautifully. A very beautiful girl. Very beautiful. Beautiful means pious. A lot of piety from the previous life. And he treated her kindly. She tells him, you can't ignore my desire. I love you. I want to be with you. He stopped praying, looked at her and said, yes, I will finish my prayer and then we will fulfill all your desires. But for now, I need to pray. Well, she waited and waited, couldn't wait any longer, went to sleep. And he sleeps little for two, three hours, eats and prays again. So she overslept. She wakes up. He's praying again. She says, you promised me. He says, you were sleeping. I couldn't wake you up. I ate, rested and prayed again. Now I need to continue praying. She waited for him for another day. He says, unfortunately, I didn't complete my prayer. I need to continue praying. Again, she couldn't wait and fell asleep. And on the third day, she's already listening. She had been listening to his prayer all this time. He prayed loudly. And she also started repeating this prayer. She repeats, repeats, repeats. She cleansed herself of all sins, repented for her actions. She confessed to him and he said, I knew from the very beginning what your intention was. I specifically stayed here to cleanse you, your existence. So I cleansed it. And she said, I don't want anything. I don't need such a life. She gave away all her possessions, stayed in this place and became a saint. That's it. She dedicated her life to prayer. Can you imagine how one can cleanse their existence? Therefore, be careful when approaching holy people. You might cleanse your existence so much that you won't need anything else afterwards. This is a joke. In fact, God gives a person everything. Children, family, work, all this is also needed to serve God. Because all the holy people need to be fed, someone has to feed them. You can work not just for yourself, but also for others. Therefore, I gave this simple example so that you understand how strongly one person can inspire another person to develop, to follow the higher purpose of life. And this inspiration always gives knowledge in the heart about how to push away old age. This knowledge is written in the scriptures. For example, this song that you will hear now is exactly the same as written in the Bhagavad Gita. It tells how to live correctly in order not to get sick. To do this, you need to follow this rule, which is sung in this song and written in the scriptures. Mourning means life in all aspects. Mourning is the mourning of the soul. If a person has mourning in their heart, it means they will live long. If it's evening in their heart, it means it has darkened in their heart, which is a sign of aging. Mourning, so what does mourning mean from the point of view of the day? Each day is an exam for a person. A person should learn to get up early every day because when a person gets up early... They prove to themselves and to God that they want to live long. When a person gets up early, their life is extended. If they get up late, life is shortened. A person should go to bed early and wake up early. That means that a person should sleep as much as needed to be healthy. Of course, not all people feel this. You need to force yourself to get out of bed. But at this time, when you get out of bed, you shouldn't experience weakness. If a person gets up and feels unsteady, weak, feels heavy, it means they need to sleep a little more, maybe 30, 40 minutes. Usually people who take care of their health know this. If you're already awake, you're not sleeping anymore, but just lying in bed, this shortens your lifespan. How long should a person sleep approximately to be healthy? About seven, eight hours for people who live in cities and have a nervous, tense life. Because if a person lives in a village, they work in the garden all day, maybe six hours is enough for them because nature cleanses them and they may not need to sleep much anymore. The duration of sleep decreases depending on the level of holiness. The more holy and peaceful a person is, it depends on the peacefulness of the mind. If the mind is very peaceful, the person is enlightened. It's enough for them to sleep for three or two hours, maybe even an hour. Some people don't need to sleep at all, but these are truly holy people. The amount of sleep needed for an average person is seven, eight hours, and you need to sleep with an open window so that air constantly comes in. If air doesn't come in, it means there's no life, no air, no life. It's very important to understand that a person should get enough sleep, but at the same time, they shouldn't oversleep, and at the same time, they should get up on time. This means that you need to go to bed earlier. You should know that there is such a rule. If you want to do something late in the evening, it means that you will do it much better early in the morning. Because morning gives a person tremendous opportunities to understand things, workability is much higher, willpower, all possibilities are higher. Maybe, of course, you need to do something urgently in the evening, it happens, but most often you have six or seven hours. And if you postpone it until morning, it means you have defeated fate. 
Because often people make premature decisions, do everything in a hurry, just out of passion. Therefore, go to bed earlier, let's say at half past nine, at ten o'clock, get up at five o'clock in the morning, and morning is wiser than evening. When a person does everything in the morning, they extend their life, and they also get an understanding of how to live, because morning time gives a person optimism. After seven in the morning, there is no more optimism. If a person gets up after seven in the morning, they have no feeling of how to live correctly. It disappears. And if a person gets up at 10 in the morning, they will never have any sense of how to live correctly. Firstly, they've ruined the whole day for themselves by getting up late. And secondly, they're simply unable to feel how to live correctly because this feeling is given by the morning time. It happens to me, and it happens very often, that I go to bed at 12 midnight. The reason is late lectures. I can't start a lecture earlier than 6.30 p.m. We start with questions and answers. At 7 p.m. the lecture starts. At 10 the lecture ends. Then I need to talk to people who have been waiting for me for a whole month. I talk to them for another hour. By the time I get home, eat some fruit, it's almost 12. I come at 12 o'clock and need to sleep for seven hours. When I'm traveling, I don't sleep less than seven hours, so I get up at seven, it's late, yes. But since I'm doing a good deed, God gives me the strength and ability to be optimistic, despite the fact that I'm violating the daily routine. If I violate the daily routine for God, then God gives me this opportunity. Even though I don't get up on time, I'm still happy, cheerful, as if I got up early. Keep in mind, it's very important to know that if you violate the daily routine for God's sake, God forgives you, he gives you opportunities. And I knew one person who was truly an amazing person. By the way, he passed away at 56 years old very early, and he passed away while bowing to the altar. And this person lived an ascetic life described in the scriptures, meaning a person doesn't go to bed on time, but prays at night. He cooked for himself when he had finished his prayer and had done all his spiritual duties, and he had many duties. He would start cooking for himself around 2 a.m. He ate only once at night, which is harmful to health, and then went to sleep very late at night, which is very harmful to health. He slept very little, about four hours, woke up maybe around five in the morning and went to serve at the altar. Then he did some of his mentoring duties. Then in the second half of the day, he prayed again, and that's how he lived. And he passed away simply while bowing to the altar. God took him before his time. A premature death occurred, but he knew that God would take him earlier. He warned everyone. He said, I will soon go back to God. I will pass away before my time. Why did he live so incorrectly? Because he lived against time. That means when it was time to go to bed, he didn't. So he did everything the opposite. For what? To be stronger than time. That means he had such a power of self-discipline that he didn't depend on time. No matter when he went to sleep, when he ate, everything was fine with him. He had no health problems. Why? Because such was the power of his asceticism practice. That means such ascetic people can live as they please, but this does not apply to ordinary people. This doesn't mean that if I go to bed at 12 and get up at 7, everything is great. Of course, it affects health. And when I come home, I immediately establish a daily routine to restore health. But if you don't have such reasons for violating your daily routine, if your excuse is just your work and your desire to watch TV, then you are undoubtedly shortening your lifespan. And if you go to bed late, get up late, overeat in the evening, don't hope that you will live long, don't hope for this because the daily routine is the main factor of longevity. The early bird catches the worm. You need to go to bed on time, get up on time, and eat properly. Eat blessed food. You can't eat meat. You can't eat food that brings degradation to consciousness. You can't smoke. You can't drink alcohol at all. All of this reduces life expectancy. A person should know all these things. You shouldn't curse anyone. You shouldn't get angry. You shouldn't take offense. You shouldn't be lazy, and so on. If a person avoids all these things, God will give knowledge to the person's heart. If one strives with all their heart to serve God, God will always give the person knowledge on how to avoid danger. What kind of knowledge? The person will have a premonition. One will have a premonition that soon one will face this or that danger in life because these dangers haven't been canceled by anyone. The time comes when a person's health deteriorates significantly. A few years ago, I had such a period that I couldn't even wear my healing stones. I was so weak that when I put on the stones, I felt worse. I stopped wearing all my stones. I couldn't wear any. Artificial methods of staying healthy didn't work, but running, yoga, and fasting still worked. So I would go for a run, I did yoga, and fasted. And this preserved my life. But at some point, I was so drained that I had a choice, either to do my own things or to give lectures. I told everybody on that, don't count on me for prayer or anything. I have no strength. I only have strength for my health and to give knowledge to people. That was all. I had no strength for anything else. 
And so I lived like this for two months. I had no strength for anything at all. And during this time, my father passed away. Because relatives feed on our strength. If we live correctly, there's enough for them too. But at the moment when God wanted to take my father, it was time for him to pass away. At that moment, God took away my ability to help my father. I barely had enough strength for myself. This is how fate works. We are not safe in this life. The time comes, and fate itself decides how our life will develop. It can take away our health for a while. It can take away some opportunities. But if a person lives correctly, they still prolong their life, despite the fact that a bad period of life comes. And if a person toughens up before this bad period of life comes, then this bad period of life cannot harm them in any way. A bad period comes and nothing bad happens to you, although you may have been supposed to die at this time. Some people ask me, if a person passed away, was it meant for them to die at that time? Of course it was meant to be. But you know, if a person passes away at 60 years old, at 50 years old, before 70 years old, it means that most likely they lived incorrectly. Why was it meant for them to die? Because if they live incorrectly, then life ends in this cycle. But if a person lives correctly, performs asceticism practice, does jogging, yoga, does everything as they should, this time also comes for them. And time will take away their strength, bring this person to their knees. But at the same time, if they lived correctly, performed asceticism practice, they had a huge reserve of health, this reserve runs out. But life is preserved at the same time, and the person continues to live. Was it destined for them to live? It was. Was it destined to die? It was. Everything depends on how you live. If you live incorrectly, you are destined to die earlier. If you live correctly, you are destined to die later. Therefore, we shouldn't talk about what is destined or not destined. Mainly all people, 99% of people who passed away earlier, lived incorrectly. They didn't perform asceticism practice to overcome the bad period of life. Recently, a plane crashed. Why did it crash? Because the engine stalled. The plane was taking off, the engine stalled, and it crashed straight into a house. Everyone died. Two people remained alive. When I watched the news footage of how people were being pulled out, I looked and saw that they had a sufficient reserve of health to preserve life, despite the fact that they simply crashed straight into a house. The plane just crashed. It fell from a great height. These two people remained alive. Why? Because they had this strength. Even in such cases, a person can survive. There are cases when a person falls from a great height. They fall either into a haystack or into water or somewhere else. It means they have enough piety. Sometimes there's enough piety, but a person doesn't need life. I had such a case. God has shown me many times how he loves me. I lived on the ninth floor. It was winter. We had snowy winters there. I don't know what the winters are like nowadays in that city. But when I lived there, the winters were very snowy. The wind would heap up snow up to two meters high near the building. Snow drifts were one and a half to two meters high near the windows. And my neighbor got drunk as a pig. He started arguing with his wife. Then there was the sound of breaking glass, a scream from his wife. I felt something was wrong. I was about 12 years old. With a terrible premonition, I went out to the landing and saw the neighbor coming out of the elevator. He had just been yelling, arguing with his wife, and he's coming out of the elevator. I had some awful premonitions, so I went downstairs. I saw the neighbor, asked how he was doing. He said, everything's fine. He went home drunk. I went downstairs, approached his window. And I saw the imprint of a human body in the snow, about a meter deep. An imprint that compacted the snow by a meter. That means a person fell from the ninth floor. He didn't even lose consciousness, got up and went back upstairs. Then they took him to the hospital. It turned out there was a crack in his spine. That's it. Nothing else. But he died a few months later, drowned in a swamp. Why? Because he didn't need life. He had enough piety to fall from the ninth floor and stay alive. I've never heard of such a thing anywhere else. A person fell from the ninth floor and then went to the elevator and went home. It's just completely fantastic. He fell precisely in a place covered with snow because if he had fallen a meter further, he would have died because it was in this place that the snow was very high and a little further there was no snow. There was none on the side either. Only this place was covered with snow and he fell right there and he imprinted himself there, got up and went home. Then people would come all winter to look at the imprint in the snow until they dug this place. It's a miracle. How can this be? And before that, a few months earlier, a person fell from the third floor in a neighboring house and died. Or from the fourth floor, I don't remember exactly. So the point is that anything can happen. But the most important thing we need to understand is that these coincidences depend on our piety. But there's also God's will if you live for something valuable. If you serve God, God will give you life. This is 100% sure he will protect you. He will give you the opportunity to get knowledge, how to avoid suffering, accidents, how to overcome your illness. 
You will receive this knowledge in advance because your life becomes very valuable. So remember, human life is intended only for serving God. This is the meaning of life. This is called a mission. If a person understands the mission of life, life becomes extremely valuable, and God will protect it at all costs until the very end, so that it lasts as long as possible. Because it's a very unique situation when a person, through their human life, comprehends this higher meaning of life. If they have understood that one should live in order to give this life to God, which is very difficult to understand, you can hear it 1,000 times. But if a person has understood this, then knowledge of how to live a long life will come to their heart. God will protect from accidents. God will give knowledge on how to take care of your body. God will give knowledge on how to eat correctly. He will give knowledge on how to behave correctly with people so as not to shorten your life. Because sometimes a person shortens their life simply because they are cursed. For example, a man abandons his wife with a child. She has nowhere to work. She has two small children. She can't work because the children are small. She can't leave them. And he says, you'll survive as you can. And he leaves her. And she says, I wish you were dead. She doesn't say it, but just thinks it. That's it. So there is no reason for such a person to live. He committed a terrible act. He essentially spat in the face of his children and wife. It happens sometimes such a thought appears in her heart. She might regret it later. She had such a thought. This is called a curse. A week or two passes and an accident happens. The person dies. Why? Because he spat in the face of his own life. He doesn't need life if he commits such foolish acts. Now I'm going to explain why. When a person commits such a terrible act, they insult life itself especially if it's done towards a close person or a dignified person. In this case, if you continue living, this offense begins to destroy your life because it turns into a life philosophy. When people have insulted someone, they have spat in the face of people close to them. Further, their life will be subordinated to this sin. They will sin more and more and more. What's the use of such a life? Therefore, it's very good if such life ends prematurely. God thinks so, not me. So God thinks, oh, this is a good idea. That means she thought so, and he immediately took it into account and took his life away. It's called a curse. This happens. A reason is needed. It's not like some old grumpy lady passed by, looked at you, and jinxed you, and your life ended immediately. Being jinxed is complete nonsense. Life can end or be prolonged only by God's will. No old grumpy lady can influence our life, no matter how hard she tries, because she doesn't have that power. God controls a person's life. He decides. It's not like God obeys an old grumpy lady who can jinx it. She goes around and thinks, who the hell do I jinx? And suddenly, she jinxes you because she doesn't like you. Maybe you were in a bad mood at that time, and God immediately obeyed. So she jinxed a person, and immediately one is a dead man. This is such nonsense, such foolishness. A person can't curse you if there's no reason. If you haven't done anything bad, they can curse a thousand times, and it won't have any effect. Why? Because this person doesn't control the situation. It's like a joke. The train started moving, and a soldier with his platoon missed the train. They're running across the platform, and this soldier says to the warrant officer, Warrant officer, stop the train. And the warrant officer says, Train, stop. One, two. And the train keeps going. Why? Because he has no ability to influence the train. He's a warrant officer for his platoon, not for the train. The train runs on its own without the warrant officer. And no matter how he commands, train stop, he can't stop the train because he doesn't influence the situation. It's the same with, I've jinxed you. You don't influence the situation. You can't take away someone's life or give them life because you're not God. Thus, often people live in these foolish beliefs. They confuse everything. They don't understand that it's God who decides who will pass away prematurely and who will live longer because everything depends on how valuable your life is. Not only the lives of the people who serve God are valuable to him, God can appreciate various deeds. Let's say a person writes wonderful poems. God might give them life because of this. Or, for example, God might give life to a person who takes care of children. Maybe they created some kind of orphanage for children, and these kids need this person, and God won't take this person away before their time. He cares for the lives of those who do something good for this world. Such people are protected by God because many people want this person to live. Without this person, they would suffer. There may be 10, 15, 20 assassination attempts on a leader's life, but they can't kill the leader despite carefully planned assassination attempts. Why? Because the whole country needs a leader. If these leaders can't be replaced because the whole country needs them, God will preserve their life despite there being many assassination attempts on them. Why? because they are useful. They give the opportunity to live to the whole country. So it's not necessary to serve God directly, but just do what God likes.
If you do what God likes, then God will extend your life and give you knowledge in your heart. He will tell you, stop lying around, get up. A person will get up earlier because they will be inspired. They will quit drinking, quit smoking. God will inspire them to do this. Why? Because their lives have value. But when a person's life has no value, they might freeze somewhere outdoors. Alcoholics or drug addicts often lose their lives. I know one lady. She prayed to God all the time, didn't drink, didn't smoke, lived righteously. And everything was fine in her life, but suddenly she decided to start using drugs. It seems she got bored somehow. She couldn't get married, so she started using drugs. And the further it went, the more she degraded. And what did God do? He took her life. She injected these drugs and died. When I started praying, I saw that he took her life because she hasn't done too much damage to herself yet. He took her life earlier to give her the opportunity to pray to God again in her next life so that she wouldn't suffer too much in this life. He took her life prematurely in order to preserve her ability to engage in spiritual practice in the next life. And that's how he punished her. Because when a person dies, they realize later everything that's happening to them. It's not like it all happens in unconsciousness. When a person loses their life, they lose consciousness. But then they regain consciousness when the soul leaves the body. The Vedas explain that before being born, the child in the womb sees up to 100 of their past lives. It happens when a woman is in the seventh month of pregnancy. And each time they see their life, they think, I don't want to live like this anymore. They think about how to live life not in vain. They think about living life with purpose, about doing something important to be closer to God. God shows these lives to the person. But when a person is born, they get into this bustle of life. These temporary affairs suck them in. They develop false ideas about why they need this life. They start to think that they need life to plant a tree, raise a child and build a house. All of this is temporary. The child will also pass away. So will the tree. The house will become dilapidated. The purpose of human life is an eternal purpose, eternal which will never disappear. The purpose of human life is God. One needs to build their relationship with God. And the way you perceive God is the way he will appear to you. If you consider him a strict person who will always punish you, then he will be strict when he appears before you. If you consider him beloved, he will be beloved. If you consider him good, he will be good. If you consider him evil, he will be evil. It means God always gives us the opportunity to consider him as anyone. The Lord can be invincible, brave, courageous, and strict. Maybe his qualities are like this. The Lord can be very strict, very brave, very courageous, absolutely invincible. However you consider him, that's how he will appear before you, because he is infinite. They limit God and say, God could only be like this. Why? Recently we had a live stream with Vadim Tunev. I said about this, why do people often think that God can only be like this? He replied, this is characteristic of humans. We are limited ourselves and therefore we limit God. We think that God cannot be any different. So if I can't be different, how can God be? God can be anything. He is infinite. There's no point in limiting him. He can always build relationships with us that we like. If we want courage, bravery, and boldness in our relationship with him, he will appear as brave, courageous, and bold before us. If we want him to be compassionate, heartfelt, capable of saving the whole world, then he will appear to us in that way, and so on. That means no matter how we pray to him, if we want to see him as the wisest, he will be the wisest. If we want to see him as the most ascetic, he will be the most ascetic. If we want to see him as one who knows the past, present, and future, he will appear as such before us. This is called a relationship with God. What does a relationship with God mean? We decide for ourselves what kind of relationship we will build with him. And faith exists for this. What is faith in God? It's a set of relationships. Faith is when a person gradually acquires qualities and knowledge about God from a certain perspective. It happens as a result of reading scriptures. God appears to a person from a certain perspective. And a person develops a relationship with God from this perspective. There are some rules that say that you can look at the face of God, but some say you can't. In some scriptures it's said that you can serve the mentor personally, and in others it's said you can't, and so on. That means everywhere there are some restrictions. They have significance, they have meaning, but you also need to know that God has no limitations. God can act however and wherever he wants. He can act through an image or through sound, through a glance, through a book. He can tell us something through some person. He is not limited to anything. There are no restrictions for him. And this is important to know. And if you have some rules in your faith, that's good. Rules should be obeyed because you're comprehending some aspect of God this way. You're learning about him. Speaking about preserving youth in general, it can be preserved to some extent. I repeat once again that there are primary and secondary things. The primary thing is the mission. 
If you're just living without purpose, wanting to preserve youth, God may not give you such an opportunity. An accident may happen and you may die. We don't control the situation. We have fate. There are many factors. For example, there's the fate of the planet, which can also take life and so on. Many things influence us. We don't control them. But if we have a mission, if we've understood the higher purpose of human life, then God will try to preserve our life in any case. This is the first rule. The second rule for longer life is that you need to regulate it because there are forces that increase life expectancy. Such forces are the sun, the earth, and the moon, at least. Therefore, one should live on earth where there's more nature. Earth will help you preserve your life. One should live according to the sun and the moon. The sun gives a person activity and heals them, and the moon gives them rest. So one should subordinate their life to these laws. That means you need to go to bed on time and wake up on time. Otherwise, life expectancy is reduced because of lack of energy. These laws of daily routine give strength to a person. The next law of life extension is called the law of proper nutrition. Study this. It's very important not to eat grain products in the evening and in the morning. You should eat grain products at lunch. In the morning, sweet taste should predominate, and in the evening, bland taste should predominate. Stewed vegetables, for example. You can also have sweets in the evening. These are dried fruits, fresh fruits, and milk with honey. You need to eat properly. When one grows old, there should be less grain products in the diet and more vegetables and nuts. As a person gets even older, they should eat more greens and raw food. There should be enough raw food in your diet to keep you energetic. Because if there's no energy but there's sluggishness, it means there's not enough raw food. Raw food means food that gives prana, gives strength to a person. How to understand how much raw food to eat? You have to watch yourself. If you're overstrained, you have too much energy, you can't sleep normally, or you can't digest anything, then you need to reduce raw food. Raw food is harder to digest than cooked food. There should also be a balance in this, but a balance should be towards raw food, because we live in cities where there's very little energy, little prana, so we need to replenish prana with raw food. And raw food means greens, raw vegetables, nuts, and dairy food too. Some say that milk is harmful. This is complete nonsense. Dairy food is food filled with the energy of love. What is milk? It's the energy of love. Milk is produced from a mother's love for her child. An animal loves its child too. Milk is always the food of love. And when people drink milk, they increase the amount of love in their body. And yesterday we said that the more love, the longer the life expectancy. Because what does love do? It calms a person's psyche. And a calm psyche means longer life. Therefore, love also prolongs life. If you love everyone, care for everyone, then you will not be sick. People know that if a person lives for someone else, they will not be sick. If a mother, for example, lives for her child, she doesn't get sick at all. She raised the child and then started getting sick. Why didn't she get sick before? She says, because there was no time to be sick. The reason is love. If a mother lives for her child, love heals her. The energy of love heals a person, restores them, and love for God heals tremendously. It gives such healing power that a person has enough not only for themselves, but also for others. If they love God, they can touch someone's head and all diseases will pass. This is how the energy of love works. It heals. A person who loves can heal themselves, can heal others. This is also a rule of longevity. One must love because hatred destroys life. If you hate someone, don't love them, get angry, then you shorten your life expectancy. The next rule is asceticism practice. While performing asceticism practices, you should treat the body kindly. You should do it for a long time, should do it calmly, with joy, and also with prayer. Asceticism practices should be combined with spiritual life. You can't do asceticism practices without spiritual life. If you're fasting, then pray more on that day. If you're running, then listen to lectures. If you're doing the stationary position of the body, pray. You need to combine all of this. When a person performs asceticism practices, they prolong their life. When a person gives donations, they prolong their life. How do donations prolong life? If you give something to people at the moment when you're supposed to get in trouble, then God also gives you mercy. Let's say you give food to those who are hungry, but you're not destined to die of hunger. You're destined to die from a stab wound, for example. But since you fed people, you made donations. God also warns you. He says, don't go there. Don't communicate with this person or there will be danger. And the person avoids danger, avoids premature death. Why does this happen by God's mercy? Why? Because the person did something, saved people's lives, so God saved their life. This is how a person prolongs their life through good deeds. A person prolongs their life through asceticism practices because it's a force that cleanses the subtle energy channels in the body.
A person not only pushes away obstacles in life, but also cleanses the subtle energy channels by asceticism practice. A person becomes stronger than diseases in old age, the time that ages a person can be pushed back. But there are two types of time. There's time that gradually ages, we can't push it back. And there's time that cyclically ages, and we can easily push it back with the help of asceticism practices. If a person performs asceticism practice, then cyclical time can't affect them at all. Let's say a bad period has come, but you're ascetic enough, and it might not affect you at all. If you have the power of asceticism practice, then cyclical time can no longer affect you. And also an accident cannot affect you, nor can prison or human malice or some kind of violence or a bullet flying at you. That means an ascetic person overcomes all types of evil influence of fate on themselves. They overcome it simply through asceticism practice. Asceticism practice pushes all these things away from a person. And a person constantly performing asceticism practices in life can learn how to use it to push away evil influences. God will prompt from the heart what to do during a bad period, how to fast, how to do stationary position of the body, how to exercise to avoid evil influences on oneself. A person will feel all of this. The ability to live increases as a result of spiritual practice. A person's mind becomes clearer. They feel danger faster. They feel how much to eat, how much not to eat. They feel how long to stay in the sauna, how long not to. They feel when they can rest and relax when they can't. Knowledge comes to their heart. One of my acquaintances didn't live an ascetic life. He lived an ordinary life and was a very healthy-looking man. But the time came and he saw himself dead in a dream, and he told this to his friend. Someone was sitting there with me and talking about my sins. I asked, where is my friend? He says, your friend didn't die. She stayed there, but you have already died. This was a week before his death, and how did death come? He was simply riding a snowmobile. And the snowmobile hit a bump, flipped over, and as a result, several blood clots broke off, clots that had been sitting in his legs for a long time, and instant death, stroke, instant death. That's it. It was already planned. You see, he had a dream that he had already died. God showed him in advance. He was a good person, but he wasn't living correctly. If he had lived correctly, there wouldn't have been any blood clots, and he would have flipped over on that snowmobile, picked it up, and went on, rode on. There wasn't any particular danger there. It's called premature death. Why premature? Because of an incorrect lifestyle. God takes away a person's life if the person doesn't value this life. There are some other points you should know. Once, when we were at a psychology festival, we went to Dombai. It's a resort in Cherkessia, mountainous Cherkessia. Amazing mountains. Dombai. It's a very beautiful place, unbelievably beautiful. There's a bowl-like formation, and there's a health resort in this bowl. There are mountains on all sides huge fir trees and pines, and even cedars, I think. The trees are very tall there. They are several meters thick. Then when you go up, there's snow, even in summer, on high mountain peaks. And we took a cable car right up the mountain. We reached the snow. And some daredevils offered us sledding on the melting snow up to the mountain. My friends say, come on, let's go, Dr. Torsenoff. I say, my life is precious to me. They say, why? Everyone rides, no one loses their life. I say, I just fly on planes often, and my reserve of piety ran out long ago, so I don't want to experiment with this ride. That means, when you ride, you're risking your life, and I can't risk any more because I've flown so much that I've run out of this reserve. I say, so you can go for a ride. I know for sure that you won't die this time. They say, you think it's not good at all. I say, I'm sure it's not good because you're risking your human body for nothing. They say, well, okay, that's all philosophy. We'll go. I say, well, go ahead. They went up the mountain. When they went up the mountain and then were coming down, unexpectedly the lead daredevil lost control. One of their sled runners went into a precipice and they rapidly came out of it. In fact, God showed them that half a second more and they would all be dead. Just because they prayed every day, engaged in spiritual practice, God didn't take their lives. He just showed them. And when they came back, they were all white as death. They met death at that moment. They came back all white as death. I say to them, will you ride again? And they say, never again in our lives, but they could have understood this right away. They didn't listen to me, but I had warned them that it would be dangerous. They decided to check because I told them that most likely they would stay alive. I could have been wrong, though. If they had all died, I would have said, well, I'm sorry, I was wrong. That would have been the end of it. I didn't make the decision to go there. They made that decision themselves, but they, in general, didn't go there anymore. You see, the idea is that people act foolishly. There is one very outstanding motorcycle racer. He always won in all races, but racing means danger, danger to life. 
But it seems somehow he had an agreement with God that God wouldn't take his life during races. He only gave him first place. But when he decided to go skiing, God didn't take his life. He just gave him a life that's better not to live. He was in intensive care for a long time, then he couldn't move, and so on. And the reason is that the person spat in the face of his own life. All these downhill skiing, surfing, flying on hang gliders, it's all playing with life. And God will punish for this. He will give you some time to play around and then simply take away your life, because this is called spitting on your human birth, if you're doing it for nothing. When I fly on planes, I do it for God, for people. Nothing is wasted in this case. But if I decide to have fun and just fly on a hang glider or parachute, God will definitely punish me. What is the reason? Because it's an incorrect use of one's human life. Risking life for pleasure is a very big sin, and this sin takes away from a person. What? A person has a reserve of piety to avoid dying in a car accident and so on. But if a person has spent this reserve of piety on riding a roller coaster or sledding, I remember on one of the trips they decided to take me sledding. Well, they persuaded me. They kept persuading me. And finally I agreed. I sat on this sled. Everyone else is sledding there without problem. I sat on the sled and hit such a bump that I flew up. And when I landed back on the sled, it hit me right in the back. That's probably why it hurts now. Something happened there. Now healing is taking place. By the way, it's good that I remembered this. And I realized that I shouldn't go sledding. Why? Because I fly on planes and I ran out of my piety a long time ago. If I decided to have fun and risk my life even in such a ridiculous way, nobody crashes on sleds. Well, God punished me. He kicked my ass so that I wouldn't get on a sled again. And I didn't because it was painful. My ass hurt, so I didn't do it again. That's how the Lord taught me. He showed me not to take unnecessary risks with my life. This shortens life. People race in cars. You're driving. Does it make a difference if you arrive five minutes earlier or five minutes later? Are you the president of the country? Does the life of the country depend on you arriving five minutes earlier? There's no such great need. No, no, they press the accelerator risking their lives. If a person races risks their life, God will definitely punish. The time will come and you will get hit on the head for this. Don't risk your life unnecessarily. So what prolongs life? The right purpose in life. It means God's protection. Next, daily routine, asceticism practice, proper nutrition, and the right attitude. When a person has a kind attitude towards this world, nature prolongs life. If a person loves nature, they preserve their lives. Love for people, for all living beings, prolongs life, while anger and hatred shorten it. So stay young. I've shared this knowledge with you. Now do all this and live long and happily. To learn more on the subject of health and healing of the body, please make sure to read my health guide, available for download on my YouTube channel or on my Instagram page. Thank you very much and see you soon.